um, to have a moment of silence in honor of those people who protect and serve this great nation, um, and also um, the, uh, for those innocent victims of war and violence, both here and abroad. Uh, we will follow that with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> uh, again, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to my home, my home township here in Fail. Um, and uh, it's a great, a great day to be here. Um, I'm going to look to uh, Clerk Chapman. Please take the roll. Commissioner Jewell. Here. Commissioner Boyle. Here. Commissioner Olson. Commissioner Rukavina. Here. Commissioner Stauber. Here. Commissioner Yugovich. And Chair Commissioner Nelson. Here. Um, thank you, Clerk Chapman. Um, Commissioner Olson is unable to be with us today. Um, she is. Uh, T attending to some uh, issues within a close friends. So um, with that, um, I'm going to change the agenda just slightly here, uh, and we are going to go into um, the uh, employee and retiree uh, longevity recognition first. We will do the public safety message second. Um, and I'm going to let me see. Who is doing the retirees? Who has volunteered for that? Commissioner Yugovich is doing the, volunt uh, the retirees. Um, and uh, Commissioner um, Stauber, would you please do the 25-year? And uh, Commissioner Boyle, will you please do the 30 and 35-year? Commissioner Jewell, I'm going to have you do the 40, but I'd also like you to take... Uh, 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 Administrator Gray's spot and uh, help us try and organize this a little bit. So I'm going to ask you to get up there and shake some hands of of these uh, retirees and everyone else uh, as they come forward. If you would do that for me, please. So with that, I will turn to Commissioner Yugovich. Uh, so we want you to come up and then we'll absolutely, okay. and you're and you're in charge of organizing that. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Commissioner Jewell. Um, with, with that, um, Commissioner Yugo. Yeah, all of you are so lucky to be able to shake Frank's hand. <laughs> uh, first off, we have Bruce Anderson from Public Works, Bernard Bateson from Public Works, Gene Polk from Public Health and Human Services, Arnett Gustafson, Public Health and Human Services, Mary Hangston, Public Health and Human Services, Cheryl Quisenin? Quisenin. Quisenin. Okay. From Public Works. <laughs> Bernard Mettler, a sheriff. Uh, Candida Nelson, an attorney. Joe Newman, Environmental Services. Diane Osipek, uh, Public Health and Human Services. Michelle Robinson, Public Health and Human Services. Judy Thorson, Public Health and Human Services. And Jill Wagner, Public Health and Human Services. Congratulations. So come on back just a little bit so we can give her a little bit of room if we can. Uh, here is the we have to move this way a little bit. Because of the light? Okay. All right. Come on this way. I know. I'm standing right next to you. Okay. You see why I put Frank in charge of organizing this? Huh? Perfect. All right. Tom, can we get come on. Next up, young lady right here? There we go. There we go. All right. Okay, everyone say Chisholm. Chisholm. Fail. 
Did you see everybody smiling? Yeah. We see we see Chisholm because we have to humor Commissioner Yugovich a little bit. Okay. Retiring the center of the universe. That's scientifically proven. That's scientifically proven. It is. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Patrick, please do 40 years too, because then Frank will stay up there and do that. Okay. Just for me. Okay. All right. The next um, thing that we have, first of all, to all of our retirees um, and to all of our people with years of service, this board clearly understands that our front line, the people that serve, the people that we all represent, are are seated here in this in this room. And we truly, truly appreciate um, the efforts that you put in every day. And for you retirees, yay, okay? <laughs> That's all I can say is yay, okay? All right, um, next um, I will turn to uh, Commissioner Stauber to do those individuals with 25 years. We will go through all of the retirees and take one, or all of the years of service and take one picture, okay? So. For 25 years out of Public Works, Frederick Gabrielson, Richard Holm. Out of Public Health and Human Services, Diane McComsky, Clarice Siever, Brian Smith, and Michael Vidmar. 30 years ago, Susanna Erickson with Public Health and Human Services, Patricia Margolis, Public Health and Human Services, and Shannon Schultz, the Sheriff's Department. 35 years, we got Peggy Arjevic, Mary Bredo Prusak with PH, uh, Margaret Grayheck with Public Health, and Paul Kent with Public Works. In 40 years, we have Eugene Pecha. 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 Okay, there you go. Public Works. Three tries in your mouth. <laughs> Thank you, uh, commissioners, for doing that. We're going to work on, for, for those of you with these Iron Range names, we're, 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 we're going to work on these uh, southern commissioners on being able to pronounce some of these, okay? I like the Paul Kitts. <laughs> Paul Kitts. Yeah. All right. about for those people that are uh, here for the retiree and the 25 year and stuff recognition for commissioners to be able to engage with you for a minute and so we're going to take uh, till quarter two and that will also allow you to sneak out of here if you'd like to. <laughs> so we stand uh, in recess until quarter two of the hour. Okay. Quarter two. Are you talking to the <laughs> 20 minutes like all right, we have no All right, thank you ladies and gentlemen. I We have a time deadline that we're up against here folks, so I apologize. Uh, we've got some bonding to do today. Um, and so um, we're I'm moving us along. With that, um, we are at a point um, a while back I asked Commissioner Olson 
to, uh, as the chair of our public safety committee, um, to bring us um, some public safety messages and, and to do as she saw fit. And she has, she's done a tremendous job with that. Um, today, we have someone here to, to uh, carry on that tradition um, for uh, even in uh, Commissioner Olson's absence here today. And I'm going to ask um, that she come forward, introduce herself, and please uh, address this board. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I did not know this was a formal thing. I was planning on sitting down and having coffee with the commissioners, so pardon me, I'll try to talk fast. We are, you are amongst friends. Yes. And I want you to relax when you talk to us, okay? Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Yugovich. Uh, I just wanted to, to uh, say hello to Jeannie. She's the director Hi. of Northern St. Louis County yes. Sexual Assault Program. We yep. so many good things, a pioneer in the field. Uh, this, is, this is great to have you here. So, uh, Commissioner Olson definitely uh, regrets not being able to be here, but felt it was very important that you bring your message forward to us and, and please uh, continue. Sorry to interrupt. So I'm here on behalf of the Sexual Assault Program of Northern St. Louis County, and I want to thank you for this opportunity. I have been with the Sexual Assault Program for 30 years, and I thought I'd just give you a little history on, on the Sexual Assault Program. Um, I did give every the commissioners folders. So um, back in 1976, there was one Sexual Assault Program, and it was located in Duluth. And by 1984, we started realizing the gap in services for northern St. Louis County. So they split up and we became the sexual assault program of northern St. Louis County and then the program to aid victims of sexual assault. Um, for, within several years, our program started a specialized support group for kids and families. We also started charitable gambling, which we thankfully ended in um, 2011. Um, in 1991, we had a fire, so we moved to several different places. And right now, it'll be three years in October that we've been in uh, Virginia City Hall. So any of you are welcome to stop by. Commissioner Djukovic, you've stopped several times, thank you. And um, we're right upstairs of the Virginia Police Department. Come and check us out. I'll put the coffee on if you let me know. Um, sorry, I'm changing all this. Not his name. So we know that sexual violence is a tough topic to talk about. And this is why I didn't want to go through all the adverse childhood effects, because I thought maybe you might have heard that from First Witness or maybe some other speakers. So I just kind of gave you this. Uh, inside, this probably sums up. This is a um, picture of a little girl I worked with. She was five. And the exercise is to where does sexual abuse hurt? And she puts band-aids where it hurts. And she said her head, her heart, her stomach, and her private areas. And so when you look at how do we help children teens and adults that have been sexually abused support is huge and we are on call 24 7 our RAC card kind of tells everything we do um, direct 24 service we are now available through calls and texts I get about uh, 2,500 texts a month from victims prosecutors law enforcement we uh, attend medical exams with victims and uh, police proceedings. Uh, St. Louis County, Northern St. Louis County, our Virginia court system, it hasn't made the press a lot, but in the last year we've had four sexual assault trials with all guilty verdicts, which is pretty awesome. We also did a study in 2015, and Northern St. Louis County actually prosecutes uh, sexual assault cases about 2% higher than the national average. So we're really doing well in our little northern St. Louis County. Not to leave out southern St. Louis County, but I just have our staff. And then, of course, we provide ongoing services for children, youth, and adults. Some of the three new things that we've just started is we're working with the uh, St. Louis County Attorney's Office, 
and we are um, pointing and educating uh, teens on the laws about sexting. And we also created a diversion program so these kids will not be criminally charged because the Minnesota law is that it's a felony to um, send nude pictures, whether it's to your boyfriend, girlfriend, if you're under the age of 18. And so we want to make sure the kids know the laws. We'll also be doing some uh, parenting information sessions. And then we started a program called Bridges for girls that are on probation. And the courts uh, send them to us for five sessions. We have found that about 85 to 90% of the uh, girls that are in juvenile uh, probation have been victims of adverse childhood effects. And I just, I don't, I don't feel like I want to lecture you a lot, but so if any of you have questions, I will take them. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Rukavina. Mr. Chair, I just want to thank you for the excellent job that you do and have done for many, many years. And in my previous elected office, yes. knowing how hard that you work, not just here at the Capitol. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out to my fellow commissioners sure. how you can split to Northern and it doesn't cause any adverse effects. <laughs> <laughs> I think I missed that's, that. Yeah, you might have missed that. <laughs> I might have missed that. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Rukavina. Any too. other, any questions? You know, I think I, I think we'll leave this open to commissioners if they want to give you a call okay. on, on after we get an opportunity. On the rack is all the numbers, this cell number. Thank you. Thank you. I really had eight pages of stuff, but I thought yeah. it was informed. Yeah. So, Mr. Chair, yeah. one last question, though. Commissioner Rukavina. the fact that you got rid of gambling because you know we did fundraising and what a headache that can be for groups uh how have you replaced funding and where we are actually, funding sources um, now um the um, violence against women act money increased so it really was in 2011 right. we quit gambling and almost broke us and um and then that following year we were fortunate to see to receive one of the Office of Justice program grants. A lot of programs got cut and closed down. And we uh, received an increase, and it's been increasing every year since. We are, right now, the program is as financially sound as it has ever been in its history. So, but we know that could change tomorrow. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Point, point out to commissioners that one of the former board members of this group is now the first uh, female judge um, yes. on Minnesota's Iron Range, Michelle Anderson. So We do. We have an awesome board of directors. People ask all the time. We have six men on our board and four women, and they represent mental health workers, the medical field, law enforcement, prosecution, crime victim rights, um, primary and secondary victims of sexual abuse. And we have just a wonderful board of directors and great funders like St. Louis County, so thank you. Very That's good, it. very good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and again, I know Commissioner Olson would have loved to have been here. Thank you for filling in on that, Commissioner Yugovich. Thank you. With that, um, folks, I'm, we've got a couple of little questions on our agenda. Because of the time, we're moving straight to uh, the Finance and Budget Committee. We do have some general, I, I, we do not have time. Um, we have to be done with this by 10 o'clock, so I'm going to go back to public comment and everything else. I'm jumping straight to uh, this time specific uh, under the Finance and Budget Committee, um, and it's the uh, resolution of the Board of Commissioners um, providing issue and sale and delivery of general obligation improvement bonds, Series 2018B, establishing the terms and form thereof, creating a debt service fund thereof and awarding the sale thereof. Uh, Commissioner Stauber, do you care to move that? So moved. And moved, is there support? Second. Supported by Commissioner Jewell. Um, I'm going to turn to Director Gottschold um, for any details I need on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Nelson. <clears throat> the action being requested is to approve issue and sale and delivery of $15,726,000 in general obligation capital improvement bonds uh, being referenced to today as Series 2018B. By way of background, uh, the County Board adopted a resolution in January of this year approving a capital improvement plan for years 2018 through 2022. 
and uh, their intent to issue, issue general capital improvement bonds to the maximum amount of $46 million uh, for the purpose of providing funds for improvements, including construction of a new government services center located in Virginia, and for construction of a new public works and administration facility located in Cook. Uh, at that time, a decision was made to break the debt into two separate issuances. Uh, the first issuance uh, occurred in March of this year, and it was a uh, sale and delivery of the first bond in the amount of $28,095,000. The second issuance uh, will result in the remaining money specific to the Cook Public Works uh, Administration facility that should uh, provide the adequate funding that we need to complete both of these projects, which, uh, as you know, we, uh, our board has taken many steps to, um, you know, to secure contractors at risk, uh, to work with our uh, property management and working with uh, our purchasing division and public works to uh, develop, work with architects and deliver these two projects. And uh, you know, I also want to recognize the great work that's performed by our county auditor's office to provide us with a bond rating to secure good interest rates on these uh, particular sales. Uh, Stacy Childers is a client representative from Springstead, and she is here to walk us through a presentation. Uh, so I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. And we do, for the record, I did check before the meeting, we do have up until 11 a.m. to complete the phone call, so we can go past the 10 a.m. deadline. Uh, just so you know, you have enough time to, to go through this. I know this is a very big uh, discussion topic, very important uh, strategic item for the board, so we want to afford it the time it needs. Thank you, Director Gottschold. We've run up against this time frame in the past. Thank you that, that there is an 11 o'clock uh, piece. Um, I will now look to uh, our consultant, Springstead, for the presentation on this. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm not Terry Heaton, who you're probably used to seeing, but um, I do have some familiarity with St. Louis County. In my previous role at Springstead, I ran the numbers for all of your putting this pen down here for all of your um, bond issues. So it's nice to see you in person. Um, you should have a presentation passed out to you, and I'll just walk through this. If you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to interrupt me. I don't mind. We can keep this informal. Um, this completes the financing for the $46 million capital improvement project you approved to finance the Government Service Center and the administrative building in Cook. Um, just a quick recap of the 2018A results. They were sold in January of 2018, a par amount of a, a little over $28 million. We saw a true interest cost of 3.08% over a term of 20 years. That's an average <laughs> principal payment over the life of the bond, principal and interest, excuse me, of about $2 million. We took bids for these 2018 B bonds yesterday. We received nine bids, and that represents 46 financial institutions. So a number of these, a number of these bidders bid in a syndicate, meaning anywhere from two to 30 different banks will come together and submit a bid. Baird rep, um, submitted the lowest bid, and they were a part of a syndicate, a very large syndicate. We have a true interest cost of um, the true interest cost is what we use as a barometer to measure the interest rates on your bonds. So it takes into the time value of money, and we started with an estimate in January, assuming a sale in November. So we pulled this issuance forward a little bit, but at that time, we were estimating an interest rate of about 3.49%. In May, we ran another estimate for you, assuming a June 25th sale, and that came in at about 3.08%. Actual rates were about 3.19%, so some are right in the middle. Flipping to your next slide. Um, um, I, oh, go ahead. We've got a question. Can I just got a quick, quick well, question. Usually when we, uh, we have an update of those nine bids, did, do you have that? Do you want that? Yep. Yeah, if you could please Nina, pass no, that around should, for us. Um, Pass those out or not, but I definitely have them for you. Thank you. So on the top, you'll see the um, winning bidder and all the syndicate members. And then the following pages have the 
of the other bidders. Any questions on? Please okay. continue. Okay. So, if we're talking about the savings that you've realized, assuming that you had sold these in November, 3.49% um, to 3.19% results in about $600,000 um, and that savings of $500,000 including those four months of carrying costs, the extra interest that you're paying by pulling that financing forward four months. So the markets are, um, you know, we don't make any claims that we can predict where the markets are going to go, but I think it's safe to say that the days of the cheap, easy money that we've seen in the past um, is not where we are in the present and is not going to be necessarily where we are in the future. The Fed has continued to raise interest rates, and while the market is forward-looking and incorporates those interest rate um, interest rate increases into the current market rates, there's still the chance that we could see something um, that would cause higher interest rates in November. So using those estimates, that's where we are. All right, so once again, this financed a par amount of 15.1 percent or 15.1 million to complete the balance of your $46 million. CIP plan. We have an average principal and interest on this particular issue of about 1.1 million. We have an interest only payment in 2019 of 800,000 and your combined debt service for 2018 A and B is just over 3 million, about 3.1 million. So the next slide just gives us a snapshot of what that looks like in whole an aggregate for both your 2018A and 2018B. We're funding a capital project of about 46.6 million. And if you look down at the bottom, you see the total bonds issued is 45.9, and that's because we issue in $5,000 increments. So that's as close as we can get. Um, this next page just gives you a snapshot of some indices that we typically look at when we're estimating rates for bonds like the St. Louis County bonds that we just sold. You can see right here in 2016, we had a low point and we've just steadily been increasing since then. And then finally, we have a little bit of information about your rating. You were affirmed at your double A plus rating, which is extremely high. The next highest is triple A. Um, so you're just one notch below that. The report highlighted a number of items, including your strong economy, strong management. Um, your budgetary performance has been excellent. So you've had slightly positive results of, and a balanced budget. You have very strong budget flexibility and part afforded by a fund balance that supports that flexibility. And along with that fund balance goes to the strong liquidity that you also enjoy. So your debt ratio is also fairly low, despite this most recent issuance. Um, you have 2.8% of market value and just 3.8% of your government mental fund expenditures. And those are just benchmark rules that S&P looks at when they're comparing your entity to different entities throughout the United States. That's all I have. <clears throat> thank you very Anything much. Anything else? I, I just want to say I, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to your staff for the accommodations that they afford us during these processes. It's a lot of work, and um, we really appreciate it. We, uh, at, at this point, this board has become a little bit old hat at doing I'll some bet. of these yeah. things. <laughs> um, that does not diminish the importance and, and, <clears throat> and the the gravity of, of what we are doing and, and how we have been doing it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to turn to my fellow commissioners first, and I, I will turn to our chair of finance uh, last on this. But um, the uh, I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity. Commissioner Boyle. 
Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you again for the presentation. And I, for the commissioners and folks at home, it's it, we've been very aggressive, I think, uh, over the last few years on getting our projects done, big projects, whether it's the Government Service Center in Duluth, uh, the projects on the range now that we're voting on today, uh, in our transportation uh, budget too. Uh, we saw that there was an opening uh, with these interest rates being so dramatically low. I think this might be the highest one we're doing at 3.19. Uh, but, you know, this is kind of near the finish line of what uh, brick projects we have and will be doing for a while. That uh, I came into this uh, county board with, uh, you know, with that double A plus already in place, which I give uh, our auditor's office a lot of credit in uh, the commissioners uh, that uh, worked on this before me. Uh, but I, I just think it's really good governance of what we just did. And, you know, county boards 20 years from now should be thanking us uh, of what we did for our infrastructure in this county and took the tough votes but were meaningful and uh, to give back to our residents uh, of quality government. So uh, I just want to thank the other commissioners on this. And uh, somewhat the end is near with, uh, with Springsteed, but, uh, uh, you know, to continue to look forward and those county boards in the future should be thanking us. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Boyle. Um, don't count on the thanking from future boards. We live in the age of criticize, criticize, criticize. Um, Commissioner Rukavina. Isn't that true, Commissioner, from the top down? Anyway, uh, I was just wondering, just so I understand it. So with the issuances of the earlier bond and mm -hmm. this one of the $46 million, what are we paying over the 20-year uh, uh, term of these two bonds? In aggregate? In aggregate, yes. Mm, what a good question. Let me see if I have that information. I have the 2018 A's in front of me, and that is about 22.6 million for the 2018 B's, excuse me. 22.6 million principal and interest. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time to put that together, sure. and I'm going to turn. Commissioner Rukavina, did you have any other comments? No, that was all I to understand. Any other commissioners that care to comment at this point? Commissioner. I'm going to weigh in ahead of Go ahead. Commissioner Stauber uh, as our chair of finance and budget. Um, look, there's there's some things here, and, and Commissioner Boyle, thank you very, very much. You synopsized uh, this very well. Um, Double A plus bond rating. Ladies and gentlemen, they don't give those away. Those are things that are very much earned. And, and I will tell you that this county board, as well as previous county boards, worked very, very hard to earn that double A plus bond rating. Um, with the help of our, of our uh, auditor's office, um, Auditor Dicklich, um, Assistant Nancy Nielsen, and others, this, these things don't happen by accident, folks. This is, this is stuff that, that uh, was very well planned out. Um, I will point out to you that 15 years ago, when we bonded, we bonded for 15 years. Not 20, 15. Those bonds, by the way, are paying off this year. Um, and, and we have several 15-year bonded uh, debt uh, pieces that are be coming off in the very near future. We then switched to some of the 20-year debt service just because of, of uh, the, the low interest rates were helping us get there, plus the fact that the, the amount of need that we had um, had to be spread out just a little bit more, a little bit longer period of, in time. But, but Commissioner Boyle, you're, you, you could not be more right in, in the statement that future county boards will hopefully look back at this and say, wow, what they did in rebuilding all of the buildings in St. Louis County, or nearly all of the buildings in St. Louis County, and um, advancing, advancing really our technology and many other things forward so dramatically, along with our transportation infrastructure, because that was a bonding piece that we did 
using the sales tax revenues. Those were tough, tough votes and tough decisions, and they took courage. And, and I won't forget the courage that was on this county board when many of those votes were taken. So um, pushing this forward, and, and I, I have to say the exceptional, exceptional work of Brian Boder in our Public Works Department is what allowed this to be pushed forward to save us a half a million dollars by financing earlier. And if it wasn't ready, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be in this situation. So while we are out borrowing money in government, we call it bonding because we couldn't possibly borrow. Um, we want something that sounds much better. We'll call it bonding. <clears throat> um, but we are, we're, we're out there borrowing money for that new car. Um, but, but folks, the amount of savings that we will achieve in, in both the GSC North in Virginia and in the Cook Garage, that's $46 million worth of bonding that is going to save this county money in the long term. And these are buildings we're building that are going to be here 75 years from now. If they're not, it's because future boards haven't taken care of them. But they were built to last 75 years. So with that, I'm going to stop with that and, and turn to my uh, uh, fellow commissioners. This is a good day. Um, and, it's, and it's the final step of, uh, of really uh, many, many, many years of work. Commissioner, you Thank you, Commissioner Nelson. Uh, just a couple of things. I know uh, Commissioner Olson and I have been the, the new commissioners for a while, and we really look forward to that January meeting <laughs> the launch of the new commissioners. But being, being new on the board, uh, you know, we've, we've both had uh, time to take a look at the, the process, and uh, we've had the discussion and how important we felt that we had uh, board members uh, ahead of us that had vision. And you could see into the future that the buildings needed to be built and it's not just about the building itself it's about being user friendly for our employees for our constituents and at the end of the day i think we will see a tremendous savings from state-of-the-art buildings that are going to be energy efficient and the, the quick building alone is going to be able to have equipment indoors that hasn't been indoors and, and anybody that knows a little bit about a diesel engine knows that they're not particularly fond of cold weather so having these pieces of equipment in up and running, uh, the maintenance aspect, there's so many good things that come with this, but we could really, as I said, Commissioner Olson and I have had the discussion, we really appreciate that uh, boards before us have had vision, and, and thank you for this, and we will all benefit into the future. Thank you, Commissioner Yukovic. Not only vision, I, I, I'm going to comment on that just quickly before I turn to Commissioner Stauber. Not only vision, but this board has been so unified in this process. And, and I want to thank Commissioner Jewell in particular. Um, very, we, this has been a long ride for you and I, okay? But, but this board has been very, very much together in, in understanding the needs that are out there and, and addressing those needs. So thank you for that, uh, Commissioner Yugovich. I, uh, I appreciate the hard work that you and, and Commissioner Olson have put in. Um, not getting up to speed, because you are up to speed, but but continuing to, to uh, bring those new thoughts and ideas to this board, it's very important. Thank you. Soon we won't be the new commissioners. Soon you will not be the new commissioners. <laughs> <laughs> to our Chair of Finance and Budget, Commissioner Stauber. I think that uh, Commissioner uh, Drugovich said uh, something very uh, uh, striking, and it was, it was because of past boards, and we had past finance chairs, Commissioner Rock and Commissioner Nelson, that helped guide the process to where we are now. And uh, I, I just thank them for their service and um, for them to be uh, very f fiscally sound in the management of the taxpayers' money. And we're seeing it in the rating right now, uh, AA plus. I mean, that's great news uh, for this for this county. And um, you know, the uh, the the past boards um, are very were very critical in setting the tone for us. And and I, I just want to publicly uh, uh, state that Commissioner Rocker and Commissioner Nelson, as our finance chairs. Uh, when they were the chairs did an excellent job so thank you very much thank you uh, for that commissioner stopper commissioner jewel uh, thank you is, uh, spoken. 
I didn't want to miss you, okay? Again, uh, critical, critical votes on, on things that are so important for our future. I bet you, though, we do have the answer to the question. That Commissioner That's Rubin exactly where I was turning, wrong. because <laughs> I seen she had returned to the podium uh, for Commissioner Rukavina's question. So the 2018 A is, total p and is about $40.9 So adding those two together in my head on the spot, it's about... 62.3 or 63.2 million in total PI over the life of the bonds for both issues. So about 15 million in interest. Mm -hmm. Yep. D again, doing it in my head. Look at you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Commissioner nice. Rickina, did you have more questions than that? No, I was just so 63 total out of the 46 issuance. Correct. Yep. Would be about what, 17? Over 20 years, about 16 to 17, 17 million. 17 million in interest. Okay. More than on my house. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Good. And thank you for pulling that together. Of course. Certainly, if, if we want that more definitive, we can get that, Commissioners, but that is a very approximate amount of, of, of the interest that is, that is due on this. Um, again, um, thank you to our Public Works folks for pushing this ahead. Thank you to Auditor Dicklich's office and to Administration Attorney's office. Everybody has to come together on these things to move this stuff ahead. Um, a half a million dollars saved by moving it ahead. Mm -hmm. And folks, um, as hard as we've been pushing on this, we knew that these interest rates could not stay at those historic low levels forever. Um, and, and we're starting to see that bump moving now. Uh, this one was one click higher than what we did in January. And by this fall, it'll likely be another click or two higher, um, possibly more. Um, and each one of those is a significant amount of interest. So um, I, I do want to comment quickly on the reserves and, the, and, the, and how we manage our reserves. Um, there was a time that we did not have the reserves that we currently have. Um, and again, that took a whole lot of courage on behalf of this board to, to uh, capture that growth within our tax base and, and go out and actually ask people, tell them that we need a little bit more to, to continue to provide the services that we provide here in St. Louis County. But those reserves that, that we see as very, very healthy, okay, are sometimes scrutinized as being too much. And I will tell you that St. Louis County has two paydays a year. Two. And you have to have reserves to manage cash flow. You have to have reserves to manage emergency situations. And at the same time as we're doing this bonding and doing all of these things, we are also setting aside a square foot amount to our capital improvement fund, which is an action that this board took about eight years ago, seven or eight years ago. Um, so we're putting money aside knowing that we're going to have future capital improvements and that fund, instead of having to go out and bond for putting a new roof on the courthouse or, or some of the other things that have to be done when you own buildings, um, we're setting that money aside now so that hopefully in the future, future boards aren't faced with bonding because we're taking that money and setting it aside as part of a part of the expenses of just running the, running the show. And it, it means that your reserves are going to be a little bit higher in places, but it's very prudent fiscal management to make sure that you have the money necessary and not having to go out um, and, and bonding for a million dollar project as an example, which in the past we used to do. Um, and so we're, we're, I think we're very much ahead of the game um, and hopefully uh, in the future we can stay there. Commissioner Jewell, I sparked something with that set well, aside of money. No, but I actually did think. So, so one of the positive things here is we've gotten most of our big stuff out of the way. And so, and we've done so at a time of low interest rates and so on. Um, I am a little concerned uh, for the future and wonder if uh, uh, our financial advisors are thinking about what is going to happen or what the effect might be of a trade war on interest rates. So does it affect it 
Is it not affected by it? Your current interest rate that you just no you no it's rate future. Rate so I think we're in pretty good shape because we've done most of our work. Right. So if really bad things happen, it's we not are gonna in good yeah shape. your interest rate. Well, you know there are a few different markets, and they all have different reactions to things like a trade war. So when you see a lot of uncertainty in the financial markets, you're like the stock market tends to go up and down, the bond market tends to see more demand. And that drives those interest rates lower on the bond market as people, you know, flock to safety. They feel oh, yes. like the bond market typically has been a safer place to have your money in than the stock market. It doesn't see the volatility that the stock market typically does. So actually, it might get better. <laughs> It could go either way. I'm not going to answer that question. Commissioner Joe, they don't have a question. Thank you. All right. Does that conclude our discussion on this, commissioners? If so, I want to get this vote in so we can get our phone calls done. And I apologize for pushing so hard on this, but um, I, I, we're, when we meet out in the county, sometimes we have these issues. Okay. So with that, um, and with the discussion concluded, all those in favor signify by the sign aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed, same sign. Let the record reflect a unanimous vote. Once again, thank you thank very, thank you very much. much. Now get your calls done. <laughs> I will. They'll all be right. waiting on me. Very good. And thank you for the opportunity to work with you. All right. And I, I, I was remiss in saying our bond council is also here today if we had other questions, but we all know he's here. Paying attention to us. So, with that, again, we're becoming old hat at this. Now, I'm going to go back to our schedule, and and I apologize <coughs> to, uh, to our audience and to, to our board members here. Just some logistics that needed to be taken care of. At this time, citizens will be allowed to address the board on items that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone here today who cares to address the board on an item that is not on the agenda? Seeing none. Um, for items that are listed on the board agenda or committees, um, citizens will be allowed to address the board at a time at the time that a motion is on the floor. Um, consent agenda has been moved. Is there support? Supported by Commissioner Jewell. But I want to pull one item down, number five. Very good. So uh, the consent agenda is before us. We do have item number five pulled down. That's under finance and Budget? Yeah. Okay. Where is it? Um, so, and yes, it is. Ladies uh, or board members, we do have a amended uh, resolution before you, so that so that when we get to item number five on the regular board, we can do that. Consent agenda is before us. Are there any other items that commissioners wish to pull down at this point? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda, signify the sign. Aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The motion is carried. Um, now I will go back to our, our we're going to, uh, this is under finance and budget. This is board consent agenda item number five. And you do have the amended version in front of you. Um, would someone care to move that? I'll move it. Yeah. Moved by Second. Commissioner Rickavina. Supported by Commissioner <coughs> Jewell. Commissioner Jewell. Uh, I would just say that our clerk has the best description of this. So and I, and I, I was going to, thank you Commissioner yep. Jewell for that. I was going to turn. First to administration, and and knowing that he was pr likely going to turn to our clerk for that explanation, Administ our director Gacho. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Uh, the action being requested is to establish a public hearing to consider an off-sale intoxicating liquor license for the Echo Trail Tavern in Porch Township. An application was received from Nicole Diefenthaler uh, for an off-sale intoxicating liquor license for the establishment known as the Echo Trail Tavern. Uh, the County Liquor Licensing Committee considered and approved the application and recommends board approval. Thank you, Director Godchild. Uh, Clerk Chapman, you have some uh, a little bit of explaining to do because there was a uh, change made during the, this process. Uh, correct. Sheridan Ellison and Commissioners, uh, the applicant, Nicole Dyfenthaler, <coughs> originally applied as a sole proprietor and since requested that the license be issued to Echo Trail Tra Tavern, LLC. Uh, Ms. Dyfenthaler is a sole holder, sole holder of LLC stock shares. Um, and we 
the change was presented and approved by the Liquor License Committee, so we're just trying to uh, keep the same date on uh, July 24th, so we're asking that the resolution be amended to add Echo Trail Tavern LLC as the applicant instead of uh, Nicole Lee Dyke. Thank you, Clerk Chapman, for that explanation. A very logical move on behalf of the owner of that establishment. Um, any further discussion needed on this? All those in favor, signify by the sign aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The motion is carried. Um, Commissioner Yukich. I believe we found our new name reader. <laughs> <laughs> he had questions, Mr. Chair. I think Chair. he practiced it. He was, he I think he might have he practiced was, it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Thanks. Chair, he asked me how to pronounce it. I said if there's not an itch or something on the end of it, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner Yugovich and Commissioner Rukavina. Um, they uh, range names, uh, and they are spread all over this great state now. Um, they're, uh, they're interesting. Um, with that said, um, we do have a couple of other items on our board uh, agenda. Uh, the next one is a resolution supporting application of the reg for regional trail designation for Voyager ATV. Uh, this comes to us without recommendation. Someone care to move that? I'll move it. Moved by Commissioner Rukavina, supported by Commissioner Yugovich. Um, Director Gottschall, anything we need to know on this further? Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, we have a commissioner who has requested that the County Board authorize application for funding and regional trail design on behalf of the Voyager Country ATV Club. By way of background, the club recently completed their master plan to establish the purpose and regional significance of, the, of their ATV trail system, and the club has sought out outside funding sources to develop that trail system. They've raised approximately $20,000 in donations to assist as matching funds. They've made application to two different grant programs. Uh, first, the Federal Recreation Trail Program, and secondly, the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. Uh, a request has been made uh, for the county to act as the applicant fiscal sponsor for these two programs. At its um, March 27th meeting, the board authorized application for the Federal Recreation Trail Program, but took no action on the application for the regional trail designation. So the, uh, the purpose of the request or the application uh, for the, the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission is to obtain a regional significance designation. And if that's awarded, the club intends to apply for up to $500,000 in additional funding. Uh, all, all projects must be sponsored by a governmental unit, so uh, the club has made a request for the county to sponsor this project. The club has indicated that it would uh, like to see us uh, consider this item Prior to July 3rd, I would imagine that's tied to some sort of a, a deadline for making the application. Um, if successful, the county would be expected to maintain the trails after the development. And uh, there, there are some uh, grant and aids that are available uh, after construction is completed to allow access to ongoing maintenance funding. Uh, the board did discuss uh, a draft trails policy at a workshop in April. Uh, while no policy has been formally adopted by the board, the board did broadly support uh, the framework presented where uh, the county would sponsor recreational trails that are part of the state of Minnesota uh, grant and aid trail system and which are at no cost to the county. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Director Gottschold. Commissioner Rukavina. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> I did get a call last week uh, in the middle of the week from Mr. Bestie from the Voyagers. Uh, ATV club and they were successful they got the maximum amount for that federal grant that we approved at hundred and fifty thousand dollars so that's good news bringing that money into the county and this would maximum they're going after the maximum uh, on the state level too said the Greater Minnesota Recreation Parks and Trails Board which you sat on so you know we've had this discussion uh, we know that the trails that we currently sponsor snowmobile trails and I believe one ATV trail. We don't really have any involvement in maintaining them because once they get that status, basically they're maintained by the clubs. So we, I think we've had a, a long discussion on this whole issue and I'm happy that they got that federal 150,000 maximum grant and this I believe application would be to try to use some of the snowmobile trails up in that area by putting these boardwalks that that then wouldn't affect you know the snowmobile trails where they go across wetlands 
Thank you, uh, Commissioner Rukavina. Uh, for full disclosure, before I turn to Commissioner Boyle, um, upon becoming the chair of the St. Louis County Board, I resigned my commission at the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails Commission. I just not feeling that I would have enough time to do both uh, justice. So I am no longer a board member of uh, the Regional Parks and Trails Commission. I do believe that this application will be looked upon very favorably by that group and uh, did advise them. There is no maximum on that number, um, but, but it's approximately $8 million that's split throughout greater Minnesota, outside of the metro, on an annual basis. This is the sales tax money that, uh, that we all voted on. Um, and um, so an application of, of, a, of in this case, 500,000 um, is likely to, to be looked upon very favorably given um, the needs that are out there that are, that are quite frankly, uh, we typically had 15 to $16 million worth of application on an annual basis for $8 million worth of funding. Commissioner Jules, well aware of that on the Clean Water Council that he serves on, um, you, you typically get a lot more than what you have money to, to, uh, to put out there. But I wanted everyone to be aware that I am no longer on that, but I did advise them on, on the process and the amount. There is no deadline for GRMPTC. However, getting it in by July potentially could get them considered in this year's funding cycle. We do not have a deadline, or that committee did not establish any deadlines. It's a continuous application, but, but July is kind of uh, an unofficial deadline if you really want to get right down to it. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Chair. You, are, you just answered my question, so. Okay, very good. And I, I, um, I appreciate that, and I, I hope everyone understands the, uh, the fact that you can't serve on all of this stuff, and sometimes you just have to pull out and, and let other good people work on it. We do have a tremendous board at GRMPTC, a lot of good people working on it. So, um, again, uh, I look forward to this one also being approved if not this year, next. With that, uh, and and uh, seeing no further questions, all those in favor signify by sign aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The motion is carried. Next. Um, <coughs> we suspend the rule. Thank you, Commissioner Jewell. Um, uh, supported by Commissioner Yugovich. Um, all those in favor of allowing this to uh, come before the board today requires a vote of the board to, to uh, get to here. Uh, all those in favor, signify by sign aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. Um, next, uh, a good news piece is the chair of our of our uh, uh, solid waste committee. Um, Mark St. Lawrence has been working really hard on this, um, and it is uh, uh, asking the board to authorize an application to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for the uh, federal year 1819 environmental assistance grant. Um, someone care to move that? I'll move it, Mr. Moved Board. By, moved by Commissioner Rukavina, supported by um, Commissioner Boyle. I'll turn to Director Gottschold, and I would note that we do have Director St. Lawrence in the room as well. Director Gottschold. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, the board has requested to authorize environmental services to apply to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency uh, for $70,000 in environmental assistance grant funding to identify and assess viable waste to energy opportunities within St. Louis County. Uh, by way of background, uh, as you know, the county is divided into two areas for the purposes of providing solid waste management services. The county, through our Environmental Services Department, provides an integrated solid waste management system for the, the larger, greater St. Louis County area. Uh, our partner, Western Lake Sup Superior Sanitary District, manages the, uh, the cities represented by Duluth, Hermantown, and Proctor and their surrounding townships. Uh, I think it's worth noting that approximately half of all of the solid and industrial waste collected in the county is disposed at the St. Louis County Regional Landfill in Virginia. Uh, the county remains committed to the overall goals of Minnesota requirements that counties develop integrated solid waste mm -hmm. management systems, expressing a clear preference for resource recovery, including waste to energy, incineration uh, over a landfill disposal. 
the county continues to evaluate viable waste energy and other resource recovery options. Uh, the county has engaged in a number of studies over the years, including one in 1988, uh, waste energy discussion with the Laurentian Energy Authority and Minnesota Power in 2002, and a joint uh, WLSSD in St. Louis County uh, initiative in 2007 to review waste energy and other resource recovery options. Uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency issued a request for proposal for the year 2018-2019 uh, for environmental assistance grant to round, round to financial assistance uh, for researching, developing, or implementing projects and practices related to all aspects of solid waste management. Uh, this is a request to put in a proposal to evaluate the waste or energy. Uh, it is very challenging to find just the right mixture of industries and proximity to make uh, these type of operations uh, sustainable. Uh, as Director or Board Chair Nelson mentioned, uh, Director St. Lawrence is here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Director Gottschold. Um, Director St. Lawrence, and I, uh, Commissioner Ricovina, if I may, I'm going to allow at least Director St. Lawrence to get started, and then I'll look to you for your questions or concerns. Well, I, I just had a quick comment, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and first of all, I just want to thank uh, Director St. Lawrence because he does a wonderful job managing our landfill. I call it a dump once in a while. He gets mad at me. It is a <laughs> landfill. And so, you know, he, he's doing a wonderful job. But I do have to chuckle because I remember 20 years ago when there was total opposition at the Capitol to burning garbage, so to speak, and mostly by Minneapolis, which is now doing it and using it. And so we've come a long way in full circle. Uh, hopefully we can do something. Maybe this little, you know, grant will help us uh, figure out a way to use, you know, the methane or whatever is being produced up there and work with a mine or something because inland isn't that far away, or Menorca, I should say. And so, you know, but it's just kind of funny how things go full circle at the Capitol once in a while. So with that, that's all. Thank you, Commissioner Ricovina. Director St. Lawrence, I, I'm going to, before I turn to Director St. Lawrence, I will tell you, late in the day, picks up the phone, all excited, Commissioner Nelson, Commissioner Nelson, I think we got a chance at this grant, <laughs> okay? Um, only, only Director St. Lawrence gets excited about garbage, but uh, we're going to, uh, I, I, said, I said, I'm sure our board would love to hear about it, and that's why it appears here before us today. Director St. Lawrence. Chairman Nelson and commissioners, uh, not only do I get excited about garbage, but septic systems are really <laughs> Um, Number two on the list. I do, I do want to just uh, cover a couple of points that uh, uh, Mr. Gottschall had mentioned in the uh, introduction, and that is that uh, for, from the purpose of, or for the planning purposes from the MPCA, they've identified a northeast solid waste area. And our region consists of the counties of Kuchiching County, Itasca, Carleton, Aiken, uh, Lake Cook, St. Louis County, and then the WLSSD district. And for the purposes of solid waste management, WLSSD has been known or been called the 88th County of the state. Um, we work very closely with the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District in partnering with them to provide comprehensive programs that try to remove as much of the material um, from going to the landfill as possible. We've got recycling programs, reuse programs, uh, special waste programs, etc. But there is that certain component that just has to find a home in, in, in landfill. And landfilling, based on the state's hierarchy, is the lowest rung or the least preferred method of, of waste disposal. Um, the most preferred is reuse and, and, um, and reduction. The second is recycling. The third is energy uh, recovery, which would be a waste energy facility. In the past, uh, there have been a number of evaluations that the county has conducted um, evaluating the, the viability of a waste energy facility and at this point just haven't felt that, that we've gotten to uh, that, that time where waste energy is affordable um, and manageable and, and again because of the area that we cover, 
um, it's something that would be very efficient and effective for us to, to implement. If we are going to do that, it would have to be looking at that northeast area. It would have to be within St. Louis County. We've got two-thirds, well, actually over two-thirds of all garbage generated or solid waste generated within our region comes from the WLSSD Duluth Hermantown Proctor area and then the St. Louis County Environmental Services Management area which is the larger more rural area of St. Louis County. Um, we have back in uh, about three years ago when it was first announced that the Moccasin Mike landfill that WLSSD and through a joint powers agreement Lake Cook and Carleton County dispose of their MSW um, it was announced that Moccasin Mike Landfill had enough capacity through 2019. Since then, that uh, timeline has been extended to 2027, so there is some additional breathing room. But we had met as a group with the MPCA and had looked at other options for WLSSD and Lake and Cook and Carleton counties. Um, within our solid waste region and beyond. And the state, in those meetings, we invited the, the MPCA, and they made it clear that anything that we were going to do going forward was going to require some revisiting and re reviewing of uh, current data to see whether or not waste energy or waste, any type of resource recovery would be, um, would be viable. Uh, before they would allow us to continue to, to landfill. Now, we've got a landfill up in, at the regional landfill in Virginia. It's a, by landfill standards, is a small landfill. It was designed and permitted to serve the rural areas of St. Louis County. And as such, to bring the waste up from WLSSD, um, we've got about a 20-year timeline left in our landfill to bring WLSSD's waste up there, which shorten that to about four or five years. Um, I, I'm going to stand corrected. To bring that up when the Moccasin Mike landfill matures in 10 years or reaches capacity would shorten our lifespan from the 10 years that we project to about four, four years. So it really doesn't make sense at this point for us to be looking at taking that waste. Um, the MPCA submitted a grant application round for an environmental assistance grant in May. Uh, they, they highlighted a number of categories in which they were emphasizing um, waste energy and solid waste management programs. Our program didn't really fit the bill because it was more of a regional concept and it was more specific to waste energy rather than organics, composting, uh, biodegradable type wastes, etc. But we made a case to the MPCA in various conversations that, you know, our waste, uh, waste energy evaluation would encapsulate not only one or two of their specific categories, but actually encompasses most of the categories that they listed as priorities for this funding round. And back in early June, they encouraged us to submit an application, work on an application and submit it, and they would give us full consideration for that application. Unfortunately, we didn't have a board meeting last week or I wouldn't have to be here asking that the board suspend the rules, but the fact of the matter is the deadline is approaching and I need to get an application in soon and thus I'm here seeking board approval to submit that application. It is for $70,000. It does require a 25% local match which amounts to $17,500. That local match can be a combination, it can be either cash, in-kind, or a combination. I will assure you that the majority of that in-kind is going to, or that local match is going to be in-kind services, so we don't have to put too much cash into this grant. But with that, I'm here to answer any questions that commissioners may have. Commissioners, any questions of Director St. Lawrence at this time? Director St. Lawrence, thank you for the hard work of your department in seeking these funds. Um, these are, I mean, obviously when we get state money back um, for us to look at alternatives, that's a very good thing. And I, I know that uh, I know that both you and your department are constantly looking for those opportunities. So thank you for those efforts. And thank you for with, your continued support. With that, I'm up.
seeing no further discussion all those in favor signify by the sign aye aye, aye. aye. opposed same sign the motion is carried um commissioners before i look for a motion to adjourn this board meeting i do want to uh, at least give you a little bit of a heads up uh administration has been looking forward um and um there's a possibility they could be coming to us asking us to uh the, seeing no need for the uh, last Tuesday meeting this month, which was that, if you recall, we did some shuffling around of our board meetings, um, and we added that meeting, and uh, with the amount of stuff that we've gotten through, um, they may be coming back to us with that. In fact, I expect that that administration is going to be coming back to us um, with a recommendation that we uh, no longer uh, hold that, uh, that special, uh, the meeting that we added will be deleted. Uh, or they're going to they're going to suggest that that meeting be be deleted. So Mr. just to give you a heads up on that, which yeah. meeting was that? It's the last Tuesday's meeting. Uh, July thirty first. Thirty first. July thirty first. July thirty first. Okay. Okay. Um, and, it, and and as you recall, that was one that we that we added when we made some shuffling in August. That's on our okay. agenda today. For the for. Uh, isn't it? Mm, no. Uh, there's rescheduled board meeting location for August and September and canceled July 1st. Okay. 31st. So, so Administrator Gray got ahead of me, <laughs> uh, ahead of what he told me he was going to do. For the first time. So, I, and I did not notice that on the on the yep. uh, on the other one, but uh, and I apologize for that. I just skipped past it because I didn't think it was important. But uh, that is. Uh, administration came uh, about a week and a half ago to me and, and ta started talking about it. I was not aware that he was going to add it uh, prior to that, but that's good. Um, so everyone's got that heads up. Uh, motion to adjourn, moved by Commissioner Jewell, because he had his hand up for me. <laughs> um, is there support? Supported by Commissioner Yugovich. All those in favor signify by the sign aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. We will reconvene as committee of the whole in six, seven minutes. And commissioner. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think it's that. I would keep, I would keep it pretty uh, general. Uh, uh, Frank is doing his part. Correct. Yep. <laughs> so I think we could just take that out of Yep. Yeah, I think you could just take it out of uh, the chairs. Yep, exactly. Just, for, just say from the entire board. Excellent. I appreciate it. Take care. Okay. And, no. Pat, and Patrick's, no, I appreciate your help. And Patrick's suggestion for sending some flowers down to Commissioner Olson. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, Just so you push that screen and take a look at that. Her. Read your piece of the the part. All right. With that, we're not going back to Dodges again, no, okay? Is. But again, commissioners, just so you're aware, we're sending some flowers as at Patrick's suggestion as a board uh, through the chair's contingency. Okay. All right. Commissioners, uh, I'm going to call the uh, St. Louis County Board Committee of the whole meeting to order. Um, and I will turn to Clerk Chapman to please take the roll. Commissioner Jewell. Here. Commissioner Boyle. Here. Commissioner Olson. Commissioner Rizzolino. Here. Commissioner Stavis. Here. And Chair Commissioner Nelson. Here. Um, again, Commissioners, I, I um, certainly our thoughts and prayers are with Commissioner Olson today. Um, with that said, um, Commissioners, you do have the consent agenda before you. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Boyle, supported by Commissioner Jewell. Are there items that commissioners wish to pull down for further discussion? Commissioner Rukavina. Uh, 314. Number four. Very good. Um, Commissioner Jewell, I will then place that under the committee. Um, with that, um, commissioners, I'm seeing no further discussion on the consent agenda. All those in favor, signify by sign aye. Aye. Um, aye. Same sign, the motion is carried. Commissioners, we do have in front of us today, um, at, at uh, his request and at the request of the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools, 
um, Steve Georgie, our executive director. Steve, please come forward. Thank you, sir. Chair Nelson and uh, commissioners, I want to thank you for this opportunity to uh, have a conversation about a, a potentially a resolution that the county board may want to consider adopting called the Big Want uh, Resolution Policy. And in the packet, I've got some information. If you look at the left hand side, it starts off with a map of the St. Louis County broadband. And the, the green area is the served area, the purple area is unserved, and the red, or excuse me, underserved, red is unserved. As you can see, uh, there is a great expanse of rural St. Louis County that is unserved for broadband services. Uh, this is certainly uh, in limiting us in opportunities, economic opportunities, economic development. Uh, it's affecting our students with uh, the ability to complete their homework assignments, depending on where they live. Uh, it's a major concern for the uh, communities and members of RAMS, which expands across the Taconite assistance area. RAMS has made broadband expansion in rural Minnesota a priority for the past three years. Uh, we were down at the Capitol this year with a rural broadband coalition. Uh, lobbying. Uh, we did secure $15 million, but unfortunately it got uh, vetoed in the omnibus um, tax bill. Um, <clears throat> the second map shows kind of a uh, more focused area, the Laurentian broadband. Uh, there was a discussion last week sponsored by the Laurentian Chamber. And once again, the predominant color on the map is red, unserved. So it's a major concern. And then there's a final map in there that shows you know, the state of Minnesota. So there's a lot of work to be done. It's not all going to fall on the laps of St. Louis County. Uh, but I think there's a mechanism here to help move expansion along and create some opportunities for providers in the future. And that's uh, potentially by adopting a Dig One policy. Under the maps, there's uh, some interesting information um, regarding the expansion uh, and installation of fiber. Uh, data from the U.S. Department of Transportation Intelligence Transportation System Joint Program Office, there's a, there's a heavy title, indicates the average cost of deploying fiber op optic cable is about $27,000 per mile. According to the FHA, 90% of the cost of deploying broadband is when the work requires significant excavation of the roadway. And as we know, you know, um, St. Louis County does a lot of road work. Um, one policy aimed at cutting is Dig One, a measure adopted by Arizona, Minnesota, and Utah, as well as more and more municipalities. Uh, the second page talks about Minnesota. It's a, it's a more measured approach that is focused on taking advantage of cooperation between federal, state, and local governments. The Minnesota Department of Transportation created a process that allows broadband providers to install copper or fiber optic cable when state right-of-ways are open for other purposes. According to Dana McKenzie, uh, Minnesota has a basic statute in place and we are now looking to align state law with federal law to leverage both state and federal assets. So we do have a state policy um, that hopefully is, is being implemented in locations uh, as identified. On the federal level, uh, in February, Senator Klobuchar um, introduced legislation in the Senate that would require broadband infrastructure conduits to be built alongside certain federal highway projects. Proponents argue the policy known as Dig Once would bolster high-speed broadband access, particularly in rural and underserved areas. And uh, furthermore, then, in, in, uh, later in the year, that uh, legislation was actually reduced or introduced in the House on that similar proposal. 
Um, so finally, the dig once is relatively simple and inexpensive policy concept that can lower the cost of broadband deployment. The dig once policies start by granting ISPs access to state or city owned right of ways. The policies can also mandate the insta installation of conduit for fiber optic cable during road construction or help coordinate broadband installation while roads are dug up. A study by the GAO points out that the dig once policies can reduce the cost of deploying fiber under federal highways in urban areas by 25 to 33 percent and roughly 16 percent in rural areas. Uh, there's also a dig once how-to guide and some additional information. Um, so the concept again, what RAMS has done on the other side of the folder is uh, RAMS as an association, the board adopted a resolution in February um, which is included and then we circulated that out to our member cities, communities, townships and asked them to consider adopting it in their communities and the list and copies of those resolutions included. Uh, we're up to 11 of those uh, anticipation of more to come. So we're starting to grow this philosophy that within these communities when they do excavations uh, to consider putting in a conduit that can be located. Um, so in the future, if a provider comes along and looks to expand broadband, hopefully fiber uh, to the homes or to a business area in that community, um, the conduit is already in place. And we don't have to go through the significant expense of excavation once again. Um, I just happened to be at a meeting last week with the uh, city administrator from Gilbert. And I believe uh, in 2019, their entire main street will be dug up uh, for a significant repair. And so um, I sent him the information yesterday, and he will be advocating that the council adopt that and make certain that a conduit is, is buried before that street is uh, completely re repaired. Um, so again, this is a, a situation where we believe to help move broadband expansion in the future, uh, if the county were to adopt a similar uh, uh, resolution or policy, uh, when you're out doing those right away, putting in new culverts in the rural areas, making sure that there's a conduit and access in those places, it's just going to enhance the opportunities in the future when you can find providers that are willing to look at the rural areas. <clears throat> I have uh, John Laughlin with me today. He's from the Northeast uh, service co-op who did the middle mile fiber project. John has a lot of expertise in this area. Uh, questions. And the last thing, uh, there was an article in MinPost last week, sometimes things are just very timely. And uh, it provided a story about uh, broadband expansion in rural uh, southeastern Minnesota. Um, and this is uh, the city of Gibbon. It's in Sibley County. Gibbon is a, a population of about 750 people. But they put together, in, in 2015, Gibbon joined nine other cities and 17 townships in creating a cooperative that promised to big, bring broadband internet access to 6,200 residents across both Renville and Sibley County. Um, so RS Fiber Cooperative laid fiber optic cable through Gibbon in 2016. And they have speeds up to uh, one gigabyte. Uh, and the second phase is going to bring more broadband to their countryside residents beginning in 2020. Uh, as a result of that, uh, this high-tech 3D printing, which is really a 3D manufacturing company, uh, located in the city of Gibbon in an abandoned bank building. So it's providing a number of high-tech jobs. They have a, a marketplace across the uh, United States, and it just shows what can be done. What's, um, what's amazing to me is they, they bonded. It was a $15 million project to do this to the 6,200 residents. Uh, the city of Gibbon sold bonds uh, at a, $813,000 in a city of 750 people. 
So they have some courageous uh, city officials down there, public officials who recognize without this type of an investment, our communities don't have a chance. And we need the same kind of bold leadership up here. Um, <coughs> so we do have, I understand, if the county were to consider a, a policy or a, a resolution, it's going to be a lot more extensive than the resolutions you see in here, which are basically a, a philosophical statement that says if we're doing excavations in our communities, we should consider uh, putting in a conduit. Um, we certainly have access to more extensive resolutions that uh, you have to Asking for your consideration, if you have any questions, John is an expert. Thank you, um, Mr. Jargi. John, do you care to address the board on just looking for questions? Okay. Um, Commissioner Bois. Thank you. And, uh, you know, over the past five years of being on the county board, I know that this is uh, such a pressing issue for folks in the rural communities. And I continue to, to struggle with uh, the, as we can see on this map here, of you know, basically what's happening is that, that these, these firms cherry pick these areas because there's enough users there to make money uh, and ignore those in the rural areas. So, I, you know, this was a year ago or a year and a half ago, Commissioner Nelson brought up a point that the turn of last century, it's, I think this is as important as electricity to our rural folks. So I, I continue to struggle with uh, a private organization that's making a lot of money that would we recoup these costs once these conduits, once these uh, agencies come in and help our folks in the rural networks? I mean, it's, that's, that's one of my questions for you. And, and you know, with a county with 3,000 miles of roads, uh, that's, that's a difficulty I'm having. Is there something at the federal, I know Senator Klobuchar especially has been so uh, consistent on, on and Senator Smith now of working on on that where is, is there any parallel argument of what happened at turn of last century with electricity with the use of private for firm Commissioner Boyle and, and uh, Chair Nelson the, uh, the, the policies that I've seen allow different uh, opportunities if there's going to be an excavation done in a community community takes responsibility for putting the conduit in they can establish in their policy that uh, upon utilization they can collect a fee for that um, in other instances and I know John with the with their project if they had providers in the area they provide notice that there's going to be the excavation and then the providers may step in and say okay we're going to place conduit in there so it's their proprietary and we, we I believe Paul Bunyan uh, likes to take that position. Um, but again, if the county was doing um, excavations and installations along their right of ways, again, if that's the way their policy is established, that we'll put it in, but you come to utilize it, there's going to be a fee. You know, again, that would fall back on the county level. Uh, Commissioner Boyle, please you, continue. You just uh, said a little bit, but has this worked nationwide with other uh, communities that have done this? Have, I mean, have the providers I mean, it, it's kind of a gamble where they could come back and say, we'll do it, but we want it for free. Uh, and then it leaves, you know, mm -hmm. county boards and local municipalities like, oh, what do we do? You know, here are folks that really need it, but, you know, we have to give it to them free or they're not going to come in. Is that, there's somewhat of a gamble on this, isn't there? Well, this is, um, the big ones is the kind of the latest name of this, but this has been going on, this sort of building of, uh, telecommunication systems has been going on for a while. It used to be called Joint Trench. And that was, uh, I've worked at other telecoms where we've had the agreements with the local municipals or other, um, either, either in other service providers, um, where if we're doing work, you communicate with one another, you network, and say, would you guys like to get, you know, some infrastructure in this area, and then what we do is we do a joint trench build out to where once the ditch is open, anybody that wants to, needs to, goes ahead and lays their facilities inside that trench before it gets buried back up. So this, this concept has been around a long time. It's just with the dig once focus, it's, um, 
I guess it's more <coughs> statewide, more of a you know policy kind of statewide that that hopefully could be adopted and just becomes common practice rather than it being built through networking. Really, is how it was before. So, thank you, Commissioner Boyle. Um, Co Commissioner Rukavina. So, Mr. Chair, maybe a question to. I, I apologize. No, I, you can go ahead, but just don't forget me. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. Well, <laughs> if and, Frank was, and, I don't want to <coughs> usurp uh, any Duluth. Co commissioner, sorry. Commissioner Rukavina, I, ap I, ap I apologize. I did glance that way, but they're, they're sneaking up on me with them. So, Commissioner Rukavina, then I will turn back to Commissioner, uh, both Commissioner Yugovich and Jewel. I believe you had your hand up as well. No, he had two. He had two hands up. <laughs> Got it. <coughs> well, I'm just wondering maybe if uh, Director Foldesey can come up while we're talking about this, because he might have an answer. You know, currently they're working on a few roads right around Pike Township, the Pike Town Hall, all the way back by the Worry Town Hall, in fact, and going by, I don't think they go by the Sandy Town Hall. Uh, <clears throat> so, well, uh, that construction company is working on that road. What kind of cost would we incur if we were to have a trench dug and then not the county putting in this line but contacting in my area, mostly it would be uh, Quest, or, or excuse me, CenturyLink now, uh, contact them to put it in. Would there be a significant increase in that bid or is there a way while they're doing that road job that it's already opened up for that orange tube we're talking about yep. all these orange tubes that you see sticking on the ground yep. everywhere so I don't know Jim can you answer that so well no this I, I, I wanted our <laughs> public works director okay. I guess I prefer to have them answer the question but I'm prepared to make some statements at the end okay very good so um as long as the uh, trench is opened up and it, you know, Northeast Service Cooperative, we play a middle mile role, we would be another entity that might be interested in, in expanding in that area as well. You know, as you know, we've got some fiber th through Pike. Um, but if, as long as if the service provider is notified the trench is open, the costs are on the service provider. They have to buy the interduct and pay someone to put it in. Um, as Steve was saying earlier, um, you know the average on, on that, that that's in your packet there says twenty seven thousand a mile. In our area, up, especially up here, uh, it's closer to thirty five thousand dollars a mile. Is what it costs for us if we go into an untouched ditch and we lay conduit and fiber through it. By the time we're all said and done, we put that mile in. It's about thirty five thousand dollars. The cost of conduit is about a dollar a foot, so five thousand dollars a mile the cost to place that conduit in an open trench is about another dollar a foot dollar to a dollar fifty and the cost to pull fiber through that conduit once it's placed and buried is about another dollar a foot so you're at three five dollars a foot maybe right to, to put that in but that's all said and done so there is there is quite a cost savings in in doing this too so that is you know the, and it's a lot easier work. You're not tearing up a perfectly good area, you know. It's already open, you know. It, it avoids people from coming down the road a, a year later and tearing it back up again. So. Very good. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Joel. So a couple of questions. One, so all the green that we see on the maps, is that all a result of the Lake County um, fiber? Uh, project yes so it's Lake County but it's also a big chunk in st. Louis County right yes. yes so the green when it says served just so everybody kind of understands served is defined by what here the state of Minnesota defines as broadband so and then to get back to what to, Commissioner Boyle had stated before about how it looks like it's cherry picked. Some of that has to do with the technology being used. So, um, Eveleth, Virginia, Mountain Iron, that, well, that's green. A lot of that has to do with because it's CenturyLink using copper plant as a last mile. Copper is a conductor, so you can only push the signal so far, so it has distance limitations. So, a lot of the red, and then 
CenturyLink or some some of the some of the um, other service providers still use copper to extend out to their nodes that they have out in the rural area. Well, that copper is still limiting as far as what the speeds it can provide. So this is what we're talking. If you can, if you can put fiber in place of that to replace that copper segment, now you can start providing a lot better speeds at the edge. Even some degree still using copper. Home, but if you can at least get fiber in that middle mile, you can increase your speeds considerably. So so is the green fiber? No, the green is just considered serve as it meets the, the definition the state has for what broad broadband speeds are. For how are. much it can be driven through the yeah. whatever pipeline. I think if yeah. you look at the, the larger state map, yeah. it's got the, the descriptions. So it's 100 megs up and 20 meg down is what the green or they consider it. Yep, so the green is, broadband. yep, the green is, what the green is saying is that 100 megs up is available by a service provider in this area. Okay. Thank it, you. It's, Where's your joke? It's, continue. It's notable that the city of Duluth, uh, which one might expect to do better, but I know does not, um, is an underserved area. Um, so then the other uh, question I had, so we, um, we, we put this in. So the city of Duluth is doing Superior Street. Obviously, a huge example of this. You dig once, you put everything under the sun, yeah. put the power in, you put the um, everything in. Uh, so it totally makes sense to me. But it's so we do some five miles out in the middle of nowhere, and we dig a trench and we put it in. How does that help? I mean, does I does it actually? I I mean, so in the end, are we going to be cherry picking the neighborhoods we'd put it in, uh, digging once? Do you see what I'm saying? So so it, it doesn't immediately make sense that we do it somewhere where there's no particular connection, but because we're doing the road, we do it. So so one of the uh one of the things that, that we do as service providers and work with the county, city, state, um, is we all have kind of built a network of where we share our GIS data with one another. So we share with MnDOT or the county and say, here's, here's our plant, here's our GIS data, here's exactly where we are. So you know if you're doing a project whether or not it will affect us in some form or fashion. And the county also shares information back with us, and you can go on online and um, we've got on a web page where you can actually go through and you can get different things like parcel information and stuff like that through their GIS program. But it could be something like that where it's a share of information um, that if the Northern Service Cooperative gets that data of where the condo was placed, we can then import that into our mapping system. We can see, okay, how do we connect the dots here? Right. What do we need to do to get to this mile, three mile segment that the county put in? What do we need to do to get to this, to get to this conduit? You know, and that, that's where I think it'd be a, like a coordination piece too. If I can add, Mr. Chair, uh, a few years back there was a, a federal grant that allowed the Northeast Service Co-op to connect 20 rural townships. So the town halls got access. Uh, we were in Cotton at a St. Louis County Township board meeting when people start saying, well, wait a minute, we're not hooked up. Well, you know, so these other townships. So again, depending on where this rural trench may be placed, there may be townships. And I know there are two townships, uh, uh, Lakeside and uh, uh, North Star, that are very interested in this. We were down lobbying last year when I think the lady from North Star Township was, we were both in Senator Bach's office talking about the rural broadband expansion. So, so we've been in communications. Uh, and their townships are saying, hey, we're, we're pretty close to some big city here, but we can't get access and, and we need some, some assistance from the county. And again, this is an opportunity if right away access is being worked on, uh, we get some, some conduit in there. The other thing that's of concern when we talk about these dig one policies, even with members of our board that, that uh, are from townships, is they don't have a GIS mapping system. 
So if we're going to do this and, and invest in putting conduit in, um, do we have access to somebody that will provide GIS mapping? And I know uh, Commissioner Nelson at one time suggested the county might be willing to do that. So that was a concern. We have a board member that actually does locating, and he was the only NAY vote because he realizes so many things are not properly marked. Uh, it creates a nightmare for him, but uh, he agreed to philo philosophically if they were properly marked. And, and, and John knows there's conduit that contains marking capability right in it. Yep, yeah, yeah, there's a couple different ways to do it. You can order a conduit that has a locate tracer wire molded into to uh, it's kind of its outer, outer layer, or you just put conduit in, take tracer wire, which is nothing more than a 14 gauge wire, and pull it inside the conduit so you can push a locate signal down it. It's, it's pretty straightforward. And, if, and then when they look at projects, they say in, these, in this information it's about 1% of a project to add a conduit. Very so. good. I, I would point out to this board, and, and because Director Georgie mentioned it, the Gilbert City project, that's a state highway, is actually Gilbert's main street. Um, now, in, a, in an instance like that, just as you stated, Commissioner Joel, it's like doing the main street of Duluth. Why wouldn't you make some of those accommodations or try to look to the future? Um, I. I, I suggested to Mr. Georgie and to Rams, one, that they take an opportunity to sit down with Director Faldesi and discuss what the logistics of this and whether or not it's something that, that would make sense um, before they came here. But obviously, time frame didn't, didn't allow that. But that conversation should likely take place. I did also mention that, that our GIS capabilities are are some of the best in the country and and hosting you know simply hosting a a uh, uh, piece that would be conduit you know or available conduit would not be an issue for us at all I mean it's just simply putting it into our system and having it there along with everything else that's there but I continue to be frustrated by broadband because I all of, or not all of you because a couple of you came from other areas of the county but all of you that came from the south drove right by a little gas station that's got three three providers that drive right through the ditch and they won't stop because they don't have to because they don't have to and we're just not profitable enough okay so they go on with federal money go all the way up to ash river uh the one that's that's in fact, you'll actually see a second conduit sticking out of the ground if you look closely because they're, they're having to repair a conduit that they put through. Um, I, think, I think this board needs to consider a number of things. One of the things that I, I have to tell you that I'm, I would be at this point in favor of, we allow all of these companies to use our right-of-way. We allow them to cross our roads, hundreds and hundreds of roads. Um, you know... Unless these companies are willing to provide service in some of these areas, maybe we should look at the feed across those roads. I believe in carrots, but I also believe in sticks. And, and I'm sorry, I'm not a corporate welfare guy, okay? And these big companies make a ton of money off, off of what they're doing out there. Um, you know, how many, how many road crossing requests, Jim, do we get on an annual basis? Uh, hundreds, if not over a thousand. And, and, and these were the same people that up until a few years ago, they were, if, if you read our tort liability claims, we were paying out 30,000 a month or, or more on, on, because we would go in and dig out a phone line, which was, by the way, not as deep as it was supposed to be or not properly marked or whatever it was. And they would sue the county and we would end up paying them. Some years back, my response to that, and I know Director Faldesi responded to all of those companies by simply saying, you know, we're looking at a policy of charging you for every time you cross one of our roads. And how do you like us now? And those claims have dropped off significantly, have they not, Director Faldesi? Yeah. Okay. That was the stick some years ago because I was tired of reading that tort liability claim every month 
where US West was was billing us for 30 grand for uh, lost time on their line. And we have provided them with space for years and years. And, and you know, there comes a time. So there, there's a lot that I think we need to look at. Thank you um, for coming here today and pointing out some of these things. Um, perhaps a, a, a future workshop on this is something that that uh, this board needs to engage in, and and these are this is kind of how this starts. Yep. Okay, so um, Commissioner Rickavina. Well, you know, we've been talking about this since I've been on the board, and Commissioner Stauber and I have been to a couple of meetings, three maybe even, because down in his area, down in here, uh, in part of his district, I think part of your district, southern part of your district, uh, and most of my district. There's no service at all. And of course, then you've got, as you said, Commissioner Nelson, you've got that Lake County connection line running by a lot of these people, but they couldn't hook up because of whatever the law said on the federal level about they had to specify who was in this district prior to it being created, and for some reason they were left out. So we've got a significant problem that a lot of people like Janet Keefe, who's on the uh, is it North Star Town Board, I think yes. it is, Yes, have, have spent a lot of time. And, and I just want to point something out. If you look up above the OU on St. Louis on this map right here, Frank, mm -hmm. you'll see that little blue area. There's a couple of little blue areas there. And the reason they're blue, along with a lot of Duluth, is underserved is pretty damn good service. Because I know I got it from CenturyLink because they brought they brought uh, a fiber optic line to a, one of their copper boxes at the Gloria Day Lutheran Church, which is a half a mile from my house. And we pay them, well, we had a deal at first for a year, but now it's gone up. It was because we had a hard line still, because I'm old fashioned. We only had to pay 20 bucks a month for the service. Now it's been jacked up a little bit. But the point being this, my wife who worked on the computer all day long in her, in her previous job is pretty impressed with the speed she has on her computer at our house. And I think the idea here is that we could have a lot more blue and green if we, well, we're fixing our roads, would allow these companies, and maybe that's the way we do it, we tell the companies, you come in, we've got our ditch open, you put in fiber optic uh, century link and maybe you can hook up two or three hundred people that you wouldn't have done because it would have cost you too much money but now you've got this opportunity and then you can still use your old copper to push it to homes that are close by and i think that's the concept here and i think we should really consider it because it makes sense when we're digging up our roads that if there is somebody whether it's a paul bunyan or Quest and I know or Century Lake and I know you can only hook up units of government, but there might be a way to get around that eventually. And if there's a way to utilize this, I think we should do it. And the sooner the better because we're tearing up all kinds of roads up up there. We're we're just in this area again above the OU and Lewis, we've got two roads that are being reclaimed and overlaid right now as we speak that maybe CenturyLink would be interested in putting that uh, orange line in and then going to see who would be interested and who could they could push off the copper to. So I, I would think that we should kind of get on this, hopefully not a board workshop, just maybe to have com Director Foldesey come back to us and say, you know, this might make sense here and there and not over here but do it because to me it makes sense. I've, I've had to listen to these people complain and rightly so for three and a half years now and I myself had no service until last year when they brought that fiber optic to within a half a mile of my house. So, uh, you know, we shouldn't be living in the 20th century when we're in the 21st century. Thank you, Commissioner Rickavina. I will tell you from my memory of uh, 12, 13 years ago chairing public works, we actually already offer that service to 
uh, these different companies and have for quite some time. Um, they don't often take us up on it, but we have offered it for quite some time. Commissioner Stauber. No, this is uh, much of what has been stated already. I totally uh, agree with. Commissioner Rookervian and I spoke with township uh, uh, interests, township officers, and this is where, this is a frustration that has happened to rural America. Uh, Director Georgie talks about the kids on schoolwork. That matters. And, and we have to understand that uh, it's going to be, there's got to be an investment, and it's just not in St. Louis County, it, it's across this country. And uh, I think that this discussion should have been had uh, many years ago. And to uh, Commissioner Boyle, to your, or, yeah, Commissioner Boyle, to your point of economic development, we, we can rest assured once this is done, there's going to be economic development in rural America. As a result? Yeah. Because this, is, this broadband is so important to our small businesses. And so uh, Senator Klobuchar introduces uh, this in the Senate. Uh, Director Georgie, do you know who's carrying it to the companion bill in the House? Uh, I, I don't know if it's listed in there. I'm not certain. That's for sure. This is something that... that this is something that we have to uh, we have to address um, for for certain. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Stauber. Commissioner Joe. Well, so I think it's interesting, and I'm I'm not clear from the answer quite. But if you look at the full map of the state, it's striking how much the areas of green are in rural Minnesota. Now I assume maybe that's part of what happened during after the recession and the investments in broadband. That, that's certainly what happened in Lake County is the money from uh, that came from uh, the administration um, after the recession was part of it. But it's interesting to me this area to the west of Grand Rapids. That's about as rural as you can get, and yet it is having. So, Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan. Is, is that it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, Paul it's Bunyan. Paul Bunyan. It's, it's Paul Bunyan, Harvey, and some of the other um, <clears throat> independent and telephone cooperatives. They've always been very aggressive. When right, really? And in fact, I worked on the first fiber to the home project in the state of Minnesota, and that was in uh, 93. And that was so in New York Mills, Minnesota, which is a little town about a thousand people in the middle of the state. So why? What, what, what's driving that that we can't get to happen over by us? I can answer that. Commissioner Rukavina, give it a shot. Because CenturyLink provides a lot of our service in the right. state of Wisconsin. CenturyLink doesn't get the same grants and tax breaks on the federal level as Paul Bunyan does. So CenturyLink is a you know, capitalistic company, and they look at their profits, and they say, well, what the heck, we're only going to get 20 people in Pike Township to hook up. That's not a good deal for us, and we're not getting, you know, this tax break from the feds, and we're not getting these grants from the feds. And even when they get the grants, which they do through both the state and the feds, they again look at the numbers of people that they hook up. You know, you brought up Rural Electric, I believe it was you, Commissioner Boyle, which was a great program started by Franklin Delano Roosevelt to jumpstart this economy in the Great Depression. And now, maybe instead of talking about a $25 billion uh, wall on the border that Mexico was supposed to build, but now all of a sudden we're building it, maybe we behoove us to put in uh, billions of dollars into broadband for rural Minnesota like we did, or excuse me, rural America like we did for Electri electrifying rural America years ago. That might be the answer because our current president had promised a huge, huge infrastructure bill and we get nothing out in Washington. We just argue and argue. It's frustrating. So, Com thank you, uh, Commissioner Rukavina. Commissioner Jewell. So, I think you, uh, I think you confuse me more. So, why would it be that Paul Bunyan. Now, I know that Blandon Foundation also was really actively involved, and they have an area in here where they provide more money than they provide to other places for broadband. But, but what is it? So 
uh, somehow they get special tax. Uh, I, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me why we can't get CenturyLink to do the same thing. They don't get the and same. I, I don't think that's a question, but we'll leave it at that. Well, it, is, it is kind of a question. It is a question. Like, so what was it that drove uh, Paul Bunyan to do such a good job? And we have a provider who doesn't do it. Now we have a question. Thank you, Commissioner Jewell. There's a couple things that, that did that. You, you mentioned REA. And so back in the 1950s, Telecommunications Act came into place. And what that did is it established under USDA REA and RUS, Rural Utility Services. What they did is they were trying to not only expand electrical services, but also expand telephone services out to these rural areas where the mob bells wouldn't go. So there's a lot of rural towns that didn't have any services at all. Um, so they made up uh, low interest loans available through RUS, where you could have like a 20, 30 year payback on. And what that did is that generated a real boom in telephone cooperatives and other independents, family owned telephone companies where they came and they accessed that money and then they built out their communities with, with telecom services. Um, so, and then they continue to, that's, that was part of their business, was accessing these loans through RUS to continue to expand up. And then in 97, um, another act was put through, the Telecommunications Act was put through in 97, and what that allowed was that took away the boundaries. So that then allowed these independents or telephone cooperatives to go into Ma Bell territory and start being a competitive ex local exchange carrier. So by you, but still again, by accessing our US loan programs, they then start, Paul Bunyan started serving in Bemidji, which was Northwestern Bell, you know, CenturyLink, you know, U, North, you know, US West, whatever. <clears throat> so they started providing service and into those areas, and that's where you see that green just start to spread, because now they could go anywhere. And Thank you. They're more likely to do it because they're the small company. Um, they get the, so we need to, uh, get a small company to come to the region. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Joe. Look, I you know there's there's a lot going on here, and and let's be let's be clear about a couple of things. Lake Connections, unless it gets bailed out, Lake Connections is that was a huge gamble that was taken that 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 quite frankly um, still could end up costing the taxpayers in that county a tremendous amount of money. Um, and that's one of the reasons why back when that was offered um, by the previous administration to us here in flyover country, um, because quite frankly, I, I don't get a, I don't feel a lot of respect from either the East or West Coast, no matter who it is. Um, we, we, are, we are in flyover country, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that these dollars were disseminated amongst corporations without the requirement that they put it into every every place that requested it and and it continues to happen today and and <coughs> if we're going to lobby for anything we need to the, the, this hodgepodge that you see here is a direct result of that where you give money to to one and and you just hope the rest of the areas will somehow um, make that happen as well um, we watched that happen in st louis county folks we watched that happen with 800 megahertz on our radio system. And Itasca County went out and applied for the 800 megahertz money early. I'm taking you down memory lane again, but uh, Mr. Maduri is running for, for uh, a house seat over there. He was the sheriff at the time. Worked hard as can be to get, to get that money into Itasca County. But when they gave the money to Itasca County, they very clearly told the rest of us up here, St. Louis and Cooch and, and Carlton and everybody else, you're not getting it. We gave it to, to Itasca, and now when Itasca has it, the rest of you are going to have to do it because otherwise you can't communicate with Itasca. That's the kind of vision that we had at that point. Um, 800 megahertz, they gobbled up all the money down in, in uh, the Twin Cities, and St. Louis County nearly got put on the hook for tens of millions of dollars 
it did cost us several million, but it was greatly reduced because we took a hard nosed stand and said, no, we're not we're not biting. We're not going into to uh, and going to fully fund um, something that, quite frankly, um, we didn't think was necessary at the time. When we finally did put 800 megahertz into place, and Commissioner Jewell, you were here, Commissioner Stauber was here, we made sure that every fire department in this county was made whole and got the money for their radios and everything else through that one, through that one bond and that one act that we did to support 800 megahertz. So we were, what I'm saying is we were last to the dance, but when we got to the dance, the music that was being played was, was music that everyone could dance to. And, and I'm proud of what we did on 800 megahertz. And I, rem I know those discussions um, got pretty intense at times. Um, some of them up at our EEP Center, Commissioner Jewell, I'm sure remembers some of them that, that got right, uh, I mean, where, where we had the guys from the state and, and we just flat told them, no, we're not doing that. Because we were being told what to do. Um, this, this whole piece, I fully support doing, working with these companies as much as we can. But somehow, um, and this has to happen at the federal level, it has to happen at the state level and the county level. The bottom, the bottom line is these companies also have to step up to the plate and work with us. And, you know, Minnesota Power did it, folks. They cherry picked everybody. They stopped one house before, one house before the house that my bride grew up in. That's where they stopped and they didn't run the line any further. If you turn at that little gas station down there, it's the third house on the left. And they just simply stopped. MPNL stopped at the second house because it was too expensive for them to go to the third house. So if government, government can do good things, but they have to have a plan to do them. And, and it's not, it is not one side of the aisle or the other. It is somehow we have to say, look, here in flyover country, okay, if you're gonna do something, do it right. Lake County is not a good example of doing it right. Giving a grant out and saying, you guys can pay it back over the years. Um, my dear friend, Paul Bergman, okay, that the reason that Lake County has it is because of former Commissioner Paul Bergman. And he passed away in the middle of this deal. And, and uh, you know, to endure what he endured in a lung transplant and then end up with cancer within three months after all of what he endured in that transplant, it's just, just still boggles my mind. But when they went into that, the government made them promises that they did not keep. And the county's on the hook. Now they're back trying to get it fixed. Actually. I don't like to do business that way. Commissioner Joe. Well, I, mean, I have some insight into the um, Lake County thing, and uh, that's a mischaracterization. But it is true that they're in trouble and they didn't do a good job. And, uh, and it's pretty clear to me that uh, had Paul lived through the final vote, um, it would have been different, but it wasn't. And so um, that, uh, the nature of that is such. But I, I think it's striking that there are companies who are doing the work. And it's probably useful for us to think about what companies we do business with so that we assure that they actually do hook up to all the folks in the local. One of the things in the Lake County example is that CenturyLink pushed back like mad. Mm -hmm. Their lobbyists pushed back. They did everything in their power to kill the project. And they didn't kill it, but they had a lot of impact on uh, what happened. And, uh, and and that was so they could uh, do make their money, you know, and and keep the folks from getting um, the internet uh, connected. So, so I I you know I'm you know we've heard this the folks from the uh, townships uh, uh, Pete and Tom talked about absolutely 
came to us, wanted to do something, feel uh, like they're left out of the whole thing. They can see that uh, a cable going right by, and they're like, what in the world? Why are we not connected? And um, so I like this idea. I'm supportive of the idea. I don't know how it will work with what we do, but I certainly would like to see it happen. And I'd like to reach out to companies who would be interested in putting the cable in. Thank you, Commissioner Jewell. I do want to point out, Commissioner Jewell, we absolutely, I don't know, I don't know if you were at the meeting in, in Rice Lake Township when uh, Lake County came over, but Auditor Dicklich and I floated an idea with, with the Lake Connections folks that we would uh, absolutely, as a county, we would look at, at doing this, and, and I, I sense broad support there, um, that if they could give us a bill for that connection to that house, that we would level that out over time and put it on their property taxes. And, and the answer from the contractor was, oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't give you a price per household. We're bidding this on a blanket scale. And, and so, so really what they were saying was, we're charging everybody else way too much and you're not willing to pay that. Um, but all we, all we said to them was, all those people in Normana and all these other townships out there, we said, give us a proposal and a cost per property that we can assess to the property and, and we will get them hooked up. And again, the answer was no. So it, it's not that we haven't made offers to, to get these people hooked up. We have. But, but why should one property taxpayer there pay to hook up everyone else? They should each pay to hook up themselves, which we offered. And, and again, Lake Connections, Lake Connections told us we can't do that. And, and consequently, a lot of people got left out of that deal. Okay? Um, so they acted an awful lot like those big companies that just plain don't care about people. Um, because they, and, and you would have thought they would have been looking for more customers, but their contractor was unwilling to, to do anything with us to try and get a number of people. And in many cases, those hookups were literally 100 feet. That, that person would have been charged, you know, maybe, maybe uh, uh, $1,000 or less um, assessed to their property taxes. They could have spread it out over the years and, and the answer was no. Commissioner Jewell. So obviously hiring the right contractor is a really big deal. <laughs> and they decided to do away with the agreement that was originally in place and hire somebody else. And oh my gosh, the person <laughs> they hired was not the right person. Right. That was a big problem. And, and it continues to bite them um, all these years later. So I, I would say that, yeah, I, I mean, I, I hired somebody to do work, or actually my wife, on our a building last year, and I would never hire them again. <laughs> we learned a lesson. They were cheap, but... That's why. Sometimes there's a job. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys very much for coming today. You certainly have spurred some dialogue that was absolutely necessary. Much appreciated. Um, and... Uh, we're, we're, uh, we've been dealing with this for an awfully long time. We don't have any answers yet. Jim, did you have something you cared to add? He was shaking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Steve. Jim, do you, if you have something more to add, please? Thank you, Chair, Commissioner Nelson. Commissioner, is a, you know, in, the, in the interest of time, I, w I won't go into it, but obviously, uh, a lot to discuss here, more than willing to uh, either address this at a board workshop or a time specific at a committee of the whole meeting, meeting in the near future. There's a lot of uh, devils and the devil is in the details here on this one. Lots of different uh, pieces. Uh, I guess buzzword for, from me for today is uh, utility coordination. It's something that we do on every project. Uh, there's an answer here uh, for this as well. We've done multiple projects uh, over the years where, where we've partnered with uh, private utilities to do things like this. So we've already done this in the past, but uh, you know, on a larger scale, that's, a, that's, that's another type of discussion. So more than willing to have more detailed discussions in the future.
Thank you. With that, um, we're going to move on because we've got several more items that we need to cover here. Again, um, please relay the message back to the Rams board, Mr. Gargi, that um, the county has heard them loud and clear. And again, this is something we've been we've been on for a while. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, back to our uh, regular agenda. I'm going to turn to the chair of uh, Public Works and Transportation, Chair Commissioner Yugovich. You do have an item in front of us. It's under finance. Um, it just, it's just a typo. Okay. I, <laughs> it does seem yeah, like I, I saw that. And I, that was kind of um, it, it, Go to the amended agenda. Uh, okay. And, and we took it away from Commissioner Stauber because it didn't belong in his committee. And we put it in Commissioner Yugovich's committee because, be, because, because we didn't want him to feel left out. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, under uh, Public Works Transportation, we have an award of bids for a culvert replacement and bituminous surfing, surfacing in Aurora. It's a resolution awarding uh, culvert replacement and bituminous resurfacing project in Aurora to the low bidder of Newland uh, Brothers, Inc. of Cocaine, Minnesota. Uh, for him. I'll move it. Okay, moved by Commissioner Rukavina. Second by Mr. Nelson. Director Faldesi, we're on your, your item right now. Are you going to turn to. Uh, um, well, I, either or. I said Director Gottschalk first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Jugovich, committee members. Uh, action being requested by the board is to award to the low bidder of Public Works project culvert replacement, bituminous surfacing project in Aurora. A call for bids was received by Public Works on June 21st for the project in accord with plans and specifications on file uh, in the office of our Public Works Department highway engineer. Uh, the location of this project is County State, High, uh, County State 8 Highway 100 in Aurora between County State 8 Highway 130 and East 3rd Avenue North. And um, we received five bids. The low bid was Eulen Brothers of Cloquet. And uh, it's recommended that the board award the project to the low bidder Eulen Brothers in the amount of $239,000. Okay. Questions or comments from the board? That being said, all in favor signify it by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. We have one item pulled down. Item number four. Um, uh, uh, I would move it. Is there a second? Oh, Mr. Chair, we have one other item left. Oh, do we have to go on back? Yes. Oh, okay. Go for it. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is a uh, resolution for the demolition of uh, an old mining building in Bowabic that I think we've seen this building at our workshop uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was bid out. There were a number of bidders, and Tony's Construction of Hibbing got the award. I'm glad to see it was bid out. I think it should be, and so uh, I will move it. And Commissioner Stugovich seconds it. So anything else to add? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, gotcha. Commissioner Rukavina, committee members. Uh, the board is requested to award a contract for the demolition of an industrial structure located at 403 4th Street uh, North in Bowabic. Our Planning Community Development Department has worked with our Land and Minerals Department to address uh, blighted, tax forfeited residential, commercial, and industrial structures throughout the county. Uh, the former industrial site structure located at this uh, 403 4th Street. Uh, forfeited to the state of Minnesota for non-payment of taxes in December of 2008. The initial clean-out has been completed and any remaining scrap vehicles and other items were re removed as part of the demolition process. Um, vendors were notified of the request for demolition bids through our Demand Star, subject to a prevailing wages requirement. Uh, total five bids were received ranging from 83400 to 121982 Tony's construction from Hibbing submitted the low bid in the amount of 83400 It is recommended to award the bid to the low bidder. So are there any questions at all? If not, I, I, Commissioner Nelson. This is the old railroad building? This is that old, I think, mining building that we've had vandalism and people dumping garbage. It may have been a rail building. It's the rail, the rail turnaround. Right. But it's the one where we've had people throwing refrigerators and yeah. there was still trash there from the previous owner. Went, 
Yeah, basically, uh, and, excuse no. me, landfill, yes. Thank you, Commissioner Rubino. This is a, this is a 15-year-old problem at least right. Right. Um, when I became aware of it, and it is, it, it is a dangerous situation. <clears throat> I am very, very pleased that this one is finally getting to the point. Um, there was a lot of cleanup in there. There was some asbestos removal. There was a number of other issues that had to be taken care of before we could get to this point. There was literally bluebird buses in there. There was, I, I, I've been through the building several times and it, it, it was an attractive nuisance that someone was gonna get hurt at. So I'm, I'm glad that we're getting this taken care of. And quite frankly, I think, I think that area, I think you're gonna see Bowabic uh, develop some housing up in that area. It, it would certainly be uh, in a great location to do that. And it's, the site itself has gotta be almost five acres up there with it's the building. Site. It's a big site, so I'm um, really, really happy. Remember that this is actions of this board setting aside these monies for demolition. Without those actions to set aside these monies, this does not happen. Thank you, uh, Chair Commissioner Rukavina. Okay, any further questions? If not, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion prevails. Again, thank you, Commissioner Joel, for jumping up while I was getting a cup of coffee there. Um, the, uh, the last item that is before us now um, is the only item that was pulled down from the consent agenda, um, and it is the County Veterans Service Director appointment. Commissioner Joel, that is under your committee. Uh, I, yes, it is the appointment of a, a new County Veterans uh, Services uh, Director as Sherry Rodriguez is retiring at the end of July, and I would move it. Support. Um, and then looking, um, I guess, to administration to frame it. Thank you, Commissioner Jewell, committee members. Uh, the action before you is to appoint Paul Kovac as St. Louis County's Veteran Services Director, uh, as Commissioner Jewell uh, reported, uh, Sherry Rodriguez, our Veteran Services Director, is retiring later this month. As um, we serve more than 15,000 military veterans in St. Louis County, uh, administration moves swiftly to ensure continuity in the delivery of services and uh, commence the recruitment executive search process as soon as we could uh, to make sure that we had not only a smooth transition, but we even had some overlap uh, for the <coughs> transition between the, the current director to uh, Mr. Kovac. Our County Veteran Services Division staffs uh, nine individuals out of four office locations in Ely, Duluth, Hibbing, and in Virginia. And uh, consistent with uh, the most, two most recent recruitments for this position, this post, uh, in 2012 uh, for Director Rodriguez and previous to that for uh, uh, Director Rich Domankis. Uh, St. Louis County uh, looked to administration and human resources to uh, source candidates. We had 28 individuals uh, submit their consideration. Administration uh, interviewed a total of uh, seven candidates and uh, we were very pleased to have someone of the quality of Mr. Kovac uh, being up, up selected as our top candidate for this position. He has over 32 years in the Air National Guard, retiring as a lieutenant colonel, and uh, has an extensive resume of leadership roles for the 148th, including a security forces squadron commander, uh, as chief of police, as a military support squadron commander, and as the state of Minnesota statewide military manpower officer. Um, his leadership and advocacy will be a tremendous asset to, uh, to both the office and to the veterans of Minnesota, of St. Louis County of Minnesota. And uh, consistent with the management compensation plan, uh, grade 20, Mr. Kovac has accepted the position at uh, step M2, which is $77,418. Okay, Commissioner Nelson. Mr. Chair, I just wanna go on the record. Uh, Director Faldus has asked that, that um, I vote no on this because he does not want to lose um, one, of, one of his very, very fine employees. But I have assured Director Faldesi that I am going to be enthusiastically voting yes because Mr. Kovach, um, we, we have been so fortunate during my tenure to have some of the best people. Mr. Uh, um, our, our administrator, um, 
directed us that Mr. Domenkis, he moved on to Washington, D.C., folks. He left us as our veteran service officer and moved on to the federal office. Sherry, I don't need to say. I, I, this entire board knows her, okay? Um, we have been so fortunate and then to get someone of, of uh, Mr. Kovach's uh, uh, credentials, not only his credentials, but, but him as an individual. Um, the only bad news on this is I don't know that we're going to be able to keep him for 20 years. I think we'll, we'll have him around for whatever we have him around for, but um, I'd like 20 years. Um, but truly an exceptional, exceptional individual. Thank you, uh, Jim and, and administration uh, for, uh, for going through that process and bringing us such a wonderful candidate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Well, let me tell you why I pull this down. You know, I've said for almost four years now that we should have one, maybe two commissioners when we select somebody to be a department head. And because we are the ones that have to answer to the taxpayers. Uh, you know, I haven't missed an election since I turned 21, and you had to be 21 years old uh, when I was young, me and Frank know that. Uh, right after we turned 21, the law changed to 18 because of the activism of Vietnam veterans, kids our age, who were dying in big numbers in Vietnam and getting injured and didn't have the right to vote. And they changed the whole voting structure in this country. So I haven't missed an election since I was 21 for 47 years. And I always make it a point when I vote to know a little bit, as much as I can, about the issue or the person I'm voting for. That's my problem here. We're required by state law to, as a board, seven of us with election certificates, by state law, to vote for a four-year term. And I don't know if that's in statute or our, the term itself, the length of the term is in our county resolution or if it's in statute. The point being, we are required by law to vote for our uh, veteran service officer. And I don't know who this person is. So I want to abstain today while I have some time to talk to Mr. Kovach. You know, I haven't had the experience with our current uh, veteran service officer and sometimes in a pleasant way. I've had four veteran service officers. I've been in Ely for three and a half years and I have had four veteran service officers. And some of them left under, you know, not the best circumstances. You know, I represent my offices in Ely, a town that provided more per capita people to fight World War II than any other place in the nation. A town that had seven people in the Bataan Death March. And there were times when I didn't have anybody up there. And, you know, whether it was Herbie Lampa, Mike Forsman, or myself, our secretaries, for th over 30 years answer the phone, Commissioner so-and-so's office and veteran services. And without any knowledge to me, when one of our veteran service officers required, they changed the phone number, directed people to not even an 800 number in Duluth, but a long distance number to call people in Duluth without even talking to me or my secretary. So this is an important position to represent those 15,000 vets that we have in this county, so one of the highest numbers in the, probably in the country and the state. I don't know Paul Kovach. He could be the best guy in the world, Commissioner Nelson. But today, I'm going to vote to abstain. You can tell me I can't. I'm voting to abstain because I've never voted on an issue in my entire life that I didn't know anything about the person. So with that, I'd like to talk to Mr. Kovach over the next week or so personally, have him make a contact with me. He's the one running for this position. I'm not running for it. And that's why I pulled it down. We have a responsibility as a board. We have the election certificates, and I've been kind of mocked for bringing this up, but it's a fact. And when we're required under state statute to vote for this veteran service officer for a four-year term, I want to know the qualifications and the qualities and the 
philosophy of that person that I'm voting for. Commissioner Nelson. Uh, thank you, Chair Commissioner Jewell. As a point of order, a more proper way of, of accomplishing what you're looking to accomplish, Commissioner Rukavina, would be to ask that this be moved without recommendation. That would give you the opportunity over the course of the next week. Um, in fact, you could ask that this be moved without recommendation to a meeting two weeks from now or whatever you would like. But, but that, would, that would afford you that opportunity to, to engage with this individual. Uh, I would point out that um, each and every time these recommendations have been made, those veteran service officers, once they reach this point, they, they did reach out to board members. And that, that has happened each and every time. Uh, the, the previous two times that I, was, that I was engaged in this, where they reached out to us. Um, during, between, between the Committee of the Whole and the actual board. So Mr. Chair, if that satisfies your need for discussion with Mr. Kovach, I would certainly ask that our chair move it without recommendation. Um, and, and I would, but I would also like to ask that we, we as a board um, ask um, Sherry Rodriguez to please come in front of this board at either the 3rd or the 10th. Um, if she's available, uh, not knowing what her availability is, um, because I would like an opportunity to thank her uh, for the tremendous service that she has given uh, to the veterans of St. Louis County. So, Mr. Chair, I'm asking to move it without recommendation. Uh, well, point of clarification, Mr. Yeah. Chair. So am I voting for this Mr. Kovach without knowing anything about him right now, or is it because it's just the Committee of the Whole that the final vote is going to be at the board agenda where hopefully I get some comfort in knowing who this person is and what he believes in. And, so, uh, and, 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 and Mr. Chair, it still doesn't address the problem, Commissioner Nelson, that I've had for years, and, and that is when we choose directors, whether it's Mr. Foldesey or Ms. Mersch or anyone in our department that heads our departments, I think that there should be a commissioner or two uh, on that selection committee because we're the ones that are responsible for that term and for that person and for selecting that person. And I just don't like being spoon-fed sometimes. I'm sorry. And I have a different philosophy maybe than the rest of the board. Maybe I'm totally wrong, but I've been in many different elected positions, and this one is a little different than all the other ones I've served on as so, far as administration kind of holding our hands. So, Mr. so I will I will accept your suggestion that it be moved with all recommendation and I will expect Mr. Kovach to contact me at least in the next, is it two weeks or a week? One week. In, in the next week so I can talk to him about his views, his whatever. I will recognize okay. you next but no, first I'm, okay. I'm going to say something. Okay. So I actually um, feel like uh, Commissioner Rukavina has made a good argument. And I have been thinking about this since he and I talked some time ago. And I, am, I feel strongly that our system um, uh, sometimes affords certain members of the board um, uh, connection to and input into decisions that are made about um, uh, people who are hired, but others uh, know little or nothing. I know nothing about Mr. Kovach either. Um, and you are asking me to vote on his appointment, um, and it's mandated by law. Um, and so I'm going to vote no. And I'm going to vote no and expecting that I will vote yes unanimously with everybody else at our next meeting. But right now, I'm voting no, and I want administration to know that if you're going to ask me to vote on a, a pick for a department head, I better meet the person. <laughs> I, I, that's an expectation. I better see their resume. I better know who they are before you ask me to vote. 
and um, and it's kind of a striking thing that I've thought about before, but Commissioner Rukavina has really pointed it out. Don't ask me to vote for somebody that you vetted, but you give me no additional information about. And, I, and there are a lot of places where it doesn't matter, but department heads matter. And, um, and I, I really think this is the kind of thing where we need that information. So this, um, the number four, you know, well, there's nothing there other than that he's a nice guy. He's been around 32 years. Um, did he talk to me about how he's going to serve veterans? Did, he give, did anybody give me any idea how that works um, and why he's the best candidate? I, you know, I might make a different decision based on how I feel about it, but I, I, I want you to know that I largely trust administration believe they do a great job, like what they do, and seldom disagree. And as I wrote you, Jim, <laughs> it, I, you would think I wasn't going to do this from what I wrote you earlier this week, but I am because I, I think this is important. You're asking me to make an important decision and there's not enough information. So with that. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Rukavina. You know, Mr. Chair, was I, did I not well, have my but hand I up? thought you put your hand down now. But yes, Commissioner Nelson. I can keep it up continuously, Mr. No. Chair, but I, I You that kind was of did one of these. Go ahead. And then. Um, Mr. Chair, I, first of all, then, I will withdraw my, my motion to move it without, without recommendation. It is, uh, in my 15 years, uh, voting against something without recommendation. I believe has only happened a couple of times, and 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 uh, it, it just makes no sense. We're, we're what we're doing in committee of the whole is we're basically the only action we're taking at committee of the whole is to move it to the board. There is no other action here until our board votes on it. It's nothing. We we can't issue a contract. We can't even make a job offer off of a vote here. It can't be done. So. The vote at the board is one that matters, so we'll just leave it go to the board. I, I, um, I guess it's the first time I've ever heard the process questioned, and uh, it does concern me. Um, it's one thing to say that you have trust and faith; it's a whole other to then say, but not this time, um, because that's that's kind of what I'm hearing here, and I, I our process is very cumbersome. We have uh, we have been involved as commissioners in hirings, um, and especially at uh, you know I, I remember the three four day process that we went through hiring um, land commissioner Kreps was on those committees. Um, it, it's a very cumbersome process that that uh, we we all went through. Um, it's not that we haven't done that, um, but I will tell you that after Mr. Kreps's appointment. At that time, at that time, the board basically directed um, our human services or our personnel services to bring us the best candidate. That's what they were directed to do at that point. If this board feels differently than that, if this board feels differently than that, then I would suggest that, that we, instead of waiting till the last second on this, that we bring a resolution forward that directs administration that that we, the St. Louis County Board of Commissioners, um, remember, um, Commissioner Jewell, we used to have a member on the Health Insurance Committee. That's another one we should have. We we used to. It was not. It was not working. Okay, because what happened was this. Okay, um, and 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 again, I'll take you down memory lane. St. Louis County got sued. Okay? We had to show up in federal court. I sat up in Ely, Minnesota as the chair of the board. And, and we were directed by a federal court judge 
to send a commissioner. And two of my fellow commissioners absolutely said that I should not be going as the chair of the board because they didn't feel they would be communicated with. So until we fix our problems, don't ask administration to fix them for us. And it's happened many times where, where these types of issues have been. By the way, Attorney Mitchell then stood up and said, look, I don't care who you send, but a federal court judge said, we have to send somebody. So who's going? I wish I had those eight hours back because those are eight hours in my life I'll, I'm not going to get back. I listened to the clock tick over there for eight hours. We lost that case, by the way. We knew we were going to lose when we went in. But, but folks, if, if you don't have trust and faith in it, then, then direct administration to do it differently. This is, and I can pull those, those resolutions. I'll ask them to go back and pull them. But I remember the conversations. I remember the directives. And, and so if you don't trust the system, then put it to a vote. Put it to a vote. My guess is that you will lose that vote. But please, by all means, put it to a vote. And, and in civil service and in our hiring processes, we're just trying to be double extra careful in everything that we do because we don't want to get sued for our process. And, and by the way, at those hiring committees or at these different places, they wanted us to send, the unions wanted us to send one commissioner to negotiations. Guess what? There's nothing stopping any of you for, to go, for going. But if you go, you don't represent the board there. We hire as a board a negotiator. So by all means, go to negotiations if you want to. You will only mess it up. That's what will happen. The right way to do it, bring it to the board. Get a vote of the board. And, and I'm just telling you where I'm at, but by all means, bring a resolution to this board directing administration to do this differently. Don't complain about it when it happens. Because this is the second or third time. And if it was me, I would bring a resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to be clear, I think administration knows what I want. And I did not say be on the committee. So yeah, it's a pretty clear, I was pretty clear about what I want. Commissioner Rukvina and that? Well, Stauber okay, I'll call on Thank Commissioner you. Stauber. Thank you, Chair Jewell. I, uh, um, when I found out that uh, Paul Kovac uh, was, uh, was interviewed and selected for the position, um, I was very excited. Paul Kovac, I've known for 25 years, with impeccable character. So when he talks to both you, I'm sure you're going to feel the same way. He's a, uh, he's a great, great individual. I've known him from his 148 days. And I think that uh, he will serve our veterans extremely well. And I think when he talks to you guys, you, both you, you'll feel the same way. I'm sure of that. So um, I'm, I'm going to support it. But uh, I'm looking forward to him serving us our veterans. Thank so you. I, I want to be so clear. This isn't about Paul, because I, I bet you he is a great person. It's more about the uh, information provided about Paul in an effort to get us to vote in favor of him. And I, it's just a, the fact that, I mean, I don't know how we do this exactly, but there, there ought to be a regular kind of consistent way um, in which we provide that information. That's what I was asking for. Yeah. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I follow up. Um, what, are you asking like a Paul's bio to have been at this meeting? I think, it, I think a bio attached to this would really be a good thing. I, I think the, it might be that uh, when that person's name comes up, they ought to be here to talk. I mean, I, I think those are very, in, and it's a department head as opposed to just make sense. I, I mean that that should happen. And the other thing that I would say is I'm voting no because it is a signal that um, I'm displeased with the process, but it also promptly sends it um, without recommendation and we vote on it. So 
So it's a stronger statement than asking that it go without recommendation. That's why I'm doing it. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Commissioner Rukavina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm, you know, Commissioner Nelson, this isn't the first time that the process has been questioned. I've been questioning it for years. And in fact, last week, I questioned how that pilot program got to us when we never discussed it in a resolution for the, for that uh, Better Futures. Without a bid, being awarded, the attorney's office and uh, purchasing, making a decision, when well, we never ever saw a resolution. We saw a informational uh, thing a, a year and one month before. So I've been bringing this up for a long time. And you know, thank you, Commissioner Jewell, because for a long time here, I kind of was under the impression that we're, Rangers were from Mars and Duluthians were from <laughs> Venus. Because finally somebody is understanding what I'm trying to say about when you, you are required in law. The law doesn't say that the administration has to vote on hiring Mr. Kovac. It says the seven of us have to vote. We have to vote. That's the statute. And I can't vote for somebody I don't know. And maybe the process, Commissioner Stauber, you bring up a good point, but maybe the process is once we've had a selection, and I still think that there should be a commissioner on it, that that person then reaches out to us. You know, I, I don't call up Pete Stauber running for office and saying, Pete, uh, you know, geez, what do you, what do you think about it? You, you call up and you try to get my vote. I don't try to get your vote when you're running for something. So that's, that was my point on this. That's all I'm saying. And, uh, you know, I've been bringing up, as I said, for a long time now. Mr. Kovac may be the best person in the world for this, but I know nothing about him. And I have a hard time voting. I've never voted as an uninformed voter in my entire 46 years or 47 years of voting. That's all I'm saying. So I'm going to go with... Commissioner Jewell, so he's not alone like I always am all the time, and uh, for now. And uh, I hope within the next week I will get a nice, lengthy conversation, possibly in person, with Mr. Kovac. Just so everybody knows, I'm not linking last week's resolution with this week's resolution. Well, Mr. <laughs> two are very different to me, but I get the argument. Mr. Chair, <laughs> maybe you think they're different. I don't. Yes, I know. So, I'm harassing you. Okay. I can take it. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Those opposed? No. No. Okay, back to you, Chair Nelson. Roll, roll call vote, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Jewell? No. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Rukavina? No. Commissioner Stauber? Aye. Commissioner Yugovic? Aye. And Chair Commissioner Nelson. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with that, I think we're at that point in the Board of Commissioner Commons. Uh, Commissioner Yugovic. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Uh, we had a, a brief meeting yesterday uh, with some of the uh, engineers at, in, uh, in, technically that's Virginia still, right? Yes. Midway. So uh, we had a meeting. We're looking at uh, revising the fee schedule for the oversight and over oversize and overweight uh, permits based on customer input. I don't know if the whole entire board is aware. There's been some correspondence about the changes, and uh, I know I received some calls. I know Commissioner Nelson received calls. So we just sat down and we're working towards uh, making some changes. Just wanted the board updated and the public updated that uh, this is not falling on deaf ears. We're moving forward and we're trying to come up with some solutions. So if you have anything to add, Jim. We'll be coming forward with a resolution in the Very good. Um, thank you for that update. Uh, I did sit in on a meeting with uh, our chair of um, transportation and, and uh, addressing some concerns on some changes that uh, uh, industry brought back to us. And I, I think it's something that, that uh, we'll see shortly at the board. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Rukavina. Mr. Chair. So the request is to lower the... Uh, yes. And this is with the new fee schedule we implemented? Yes. 
dealing with everything from township increases on township roads no, to no, no no just for a contract no, but I but I'm saying that was the fee schedule that was it and it was yeah. Okay. Yes. it and and to be very clear and in that conversation and Commissioner Yugovich and I had this conversation that we're it's not just the change in the fee it's it's the the contracting industry did not truly have a good understanding of what we were trying to accomplish and quite frankly we learned during the process that the contracting community had not been accurately reporting uh, heavy hauls in the past had they been our fee would have more accurately reflected um, that level of of uh, utilization once we learned of that level of utilization um, it became very easy to look at that fee um, to support what we're trying to accomplish which by the way is so bloody easy even I could navigate my way through it on on the uh, website Commissioner Yugovich I, I was just going to add we were fortunate enough to have fortunate enough to have Vic Lund uh, whose wife is from the range uh, and there yesterday and walk us through the process she's a Chisholm girl by the way Why go ahead say, yeah. you know? <laughs> so but uh, yeah it was it was uh, it was really interesting he walked us through the process on the big screen and it is I, I thought it was much more complex it was not it was something that I think everybody can uh, wrap their arms around and, and actually make good use of it because it seemed to go real quick uh, my opinion and and the absolute necessity for us St. Louis County to have knowledge of of the heavy hauls especially as it relates to bridges we're, we're you know we've got 600 bridges in this county and we're desperately trying to fix them um, so that they meet the expectations of industry but the reality is is that a number of those bridges still do not and and once damage is done to that bridge by a heavy load as an example it's hard to undo it um, and so it's just that that need for that knowledge but um, I thought uh, again I thought Vic and, and Commissioner Yugovich thank you for your hard work on that by the way um, we're, we're uh, very much spot on and very prepared to bring something to this board for further dialogue and, and it does give us the opportunity to track those loads across the bridges and find out exactly what's going over and, and should it or shouldn't it be on there thank you uh, again for your hard work on that Commissioner Yugovich very much appreciate it any further dialogue from commissioners at this point Commissioner Rukavina uh, <clears throat> thank you mr. chair uh, about a week ago maybe a little over I received a letter from the chair of the Sandy Township Board which kind of stunned me a little bit uh, and basically the gist of the letter is that because Sandy is a sparsely populated it's even less people in Sandy than in Pike uh, they don't meet some of the requirements for being having chloride put on their main roads now their main roads are 302 and 303 and so because the county public works has their formula and the formula didn't work for Sandy Township Sandy Township has some years expended according to his letter up to six thousand dollars to pay the county to chloride our county roads now you know I have more gravel roads than commissioners in district one two three and five have total roads and I think we don't need a workshop on this but we need an explanation because uh, I'll wait till Commissioner Stauber gets back but about a month ago Commissioner Stauber brought up at the end of a committee of the whole meeting that he had had a question from a constituent about chlorinating the roads and I think uh, I'm bringing up the, the question you asked about a month ago Commissioner Stauber about chloride on roads that your constituent had brought up and Commissioner uh, Director Foldesy happened to be at the meeting and said we have a formula well again we set the policy in this county 
And so I don't understand, you know, why we would have to have a township, and not a very rich township, chloride roads that belong to us because we have, our formula doesn't work for them. You know, I know we have a formula, I believe if it's 50 or more a day, we spot chloride. So what if there's 48 cars a day? You know, the dust and the road are going to deteriorate and the dust isn't going to people's yards. And, you know, I, I travel, travel these roads a lot. I travel County Road 304 and 303 a lot. I am stunned that they don't have, you know, enough traffic because I always see traffic on them. But I would like to have a after or during a time specific, Mr. Chair, a little discussion on this whole chloride because I think as this letter points out and I'm very disturbed because I told the chair of the board who kind of sent me this letter which wasn't the nice letter and I called him up personally and I said I don't disagree with some of the stuff you're talking about in here but why don't you come and talk to the county board in fail we're going to be in fail next week and you can get five minutes to you know, talk about it, and he said, oh, I'm going to be there, and then they don't show up. They're pretty brave on the phone or in a letter, but if they don't stand up for themselves, that's a whole other issue. But I think we have to have a discussion on this. We've got our transportation sales tax money. We're doing the GRIP program. Uh, I just took the detour around the bridge on Highway 100, and you had a nice thank you for chloriding that, but then on one of the other roads, there wasn't much chloride where people can go for a shortcut. So it's a discussion we have to have because your constituent brought it up, mine did, and you know, if there's 48 people instead of 50, there's got to be some leeway into doing these things. I just last week had two guys call me from up in Brimson area that were flipping out and going crazy and threatening and complaining about our drivers and the dust and their grandkids couldn't play in, in the yard and so we need a little discussion on it. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Rukavina. I will take a look at our board agendas and see if we can't pull something together. I, I will remind commissioners, and I'm not trying to do a report here, Commissioner Rukavina, but it is not the policy of public works on chloriding. It is the policy of the St. Louis County Board because the County Board enacted that policy. Um, if that policy needs to be revised, then someone on the St. Louis County Board has to bring it back up for potential revision. I would also remind um, commissioners at this point, um, it, it, that process is going to take some time because of the cost associated with chloriding. We have expanded our chloriding program <coughs> based on the number of roads that we are doing the grip on because the, when those roads are done with the grip program, they no longer need the chloride application. And so we've kept the number on chloride, the dollars on chloride the same. Um, and I'm only offering this as an explanation so that everyone clearly understands. It's a St. Louis County board policy as, as is the policy on plowing Several years ago, we changed plowing from two inches of snow to three inches of snow based on the amount of dollars it would save. So there's, there, these are, and, and maybe we're remiss, um, Commissioner Rickavina, maybe we are remiss as a board to not go over this stuff on a more regular basis, but, but when these policies are established by the board, they typically stick around until a commissioner brings it back up for a policy revision. And, and again, that policy revision is going to have to be accompanied by dollars because the department can't do it without money. So, but I appreciate, I also hear a number of complaints on gravel roads this time of the year and it, it, um, it's, it, it is the expectations that our citizens have um, are, are just, but, but sometimes there is a limiting factor which is the amount of dollars available to to accomplish those things. But thank you for bringing that forward. Um, anybody else have anything? I, I, I only want to mention one thing. I, I, I had an opportunity um, last week and one that was afforded me by, by quite frankly, Commissioner Stauber and, and, and some others. And, and that was an opportunity to, uh, to engage with the, the uh,
current president of, the, of these United States. And uh, I, I have to tell you that that, that in and of itself, um, I've never had that opportunity in my life. Um, and it's a humbling experience. And, and the truth is I would have been there whether it was whether it was the former president, the current president, or five presidents ago. Um, and I don't even know, I can't even remember off the top of my head who was five presidents ago, but the, the truth is um, it, it was a tremendous opportunity. And, and um, the one statement that I made is the exact statement that I've been making over and over again, and that is that we have been mining up here for over 100 years. And we still have the cleanest lakes, rivers, and streams in the United States of America. And all our people want up here is just leave us alone and let us do what we do. And, and I asked him to carry that message back inside the Beltway so that, so that the folks in Washington understand um, that we're not children up here. We're not children. We are grown adults who care very much about our environment and care very much about our way of life. Um, and uh, I truly hope, I, f I felt good about his reaction, and, uh, and I, I, I just thought that it, was, that it was quite an honor. I would also like to uninvite the writer of, uh, in the Rolling Stones magazine, please don't come to my district. You might find grime, you might find a, a, an open pit mine. You might even actually have to drink water in Virginia or some of my communities that draw their their, their water from those, from those abandoned mine pits. And I do not want her to have to go through that. So um, I'm, I, uh, I just want to make sure that she's uninvited from the 6th District on behalf of the people I represent. Mr. Chair, uh, Mayor Mr. Larson, I think, took care of, of that uh, writer of Rolling Stone. If you I, have a I, it's, it's, I, would, I would assume that she was as offended um, as I one. was for the city of Duluth as well. What a, you know, when you go down to the city of Duluth, everyone who shows up there that has never been there before says, wow, what a beautiful, beautiful place. And, and it is. And, and the comments that were made um, were just, again, I hope she never comes to my district. There's three million people that come up here on an annual basis because they love this place. Um, but we're flyover country, folks. Um, but, but again, three million people come here because they want a piece of what we all enjoy every day. And for you Duluth commissioners, um, I have never felt anything but uh, the, the fact that, that Duluth is a jewel in terms of our tourist industry. It is a Sorry. jewel. Sorry. I, and I chose that word carefully, Mr. Jewel. Um, but it truly is a jewel um, that, that the rest of the state and the nation would love to have within their jurisdiction. With that, and seeing no further comments, all those in favor, uh, or a motion to adjourn would be in order. Moved by Commissioner Yugovich, seconded by Commissioner Jewell. Um, all those in favor signify by the sign aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. Thank you, Commissioner. By the way, the guy that just showed up over there in that, in that